All right, it is seven o'clock. Let's go ahead and uh, call uh, tonight's meeting to order. Um, and I just want to welcome everyone to the October 13th, 2020 special elect uh, electronic meeting for the Falls Church City School Board. And uh, Ms. Goodell, will you call the roll, please? Yes, uh, Dr. Anderson. Here. Dr. Dimmick. Here. Ms. Downs. Here. Ms. Litton. Here. Mr. Reitinger. Here. Ms. Russell. Here. And Mr. Webb. Mr. Webb, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go uh, any further, I just want to remind everyone that on uh, on uh, April 6th, the City Council adopted Emergency Ordinance TO 20-12, which allows for the school board to meet electronically in order to address continuity of operations associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Our electronic meetings will still be open to the public. There'll be an opportunity for the public to submit public comments to be read at the meeting and all meeting notices will be posted on the FCCPS website with the agendas available in advance on board docs. Um, would you all rise please and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America, America and to and the to republic, republic for which, for which it, stands, it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. Thank you. I would seek a motion regarding tonight's agenda. Mr. Chairman, I move to adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you, Mr. Reininger. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Uh, Ms. Goodell? Uh, yes, Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. And Mr. Webb is not here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will move on now to public comments uh, and requests. And I'll remind everyone that um, um, we, while the state of emergency remains into, in effect due to COVID-19, written statements may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to board members. Public comments will be read into the record for a period of 30 minutes or until all submitted comments are read, whichever comes first. And in accordance with school board policy BDDH, the time for each speaker is limited to three minutes. Um, please send written statements to school board clerk, Marty Goodell at goodellm at fccps.org. And public comments received by 10 a.m. on the day of the meeting will be posted on board docs prior to the meeting. Um, and before we start with public comments, I, I just want to note, uh, we do have a couple of guests, uh, Mr. Benton and um, Mr. Delaney are on with us and just to let you, let you know that we'll, we have, I believe enough public comments that we will probably go our full 30 minutes and then we have a short uh, uh, session, uh, closed session for that. So if that uh, affects your, your timing on things, just so you know. Um, so Ms. Goodell, um, I think we have about 10, 12 comments tonight. Yes, we have 10 comments. Okay. So I'll, I'll start. The first uh, is from Bethany Henderson on feedback on the latest return to in-person school plan. She writes, good evening, Mr. Superintendent and esteemed members of the school board. Thank you for thinking creative, uh, creatively about ways to return in-person learning and for your focus on bringing back first the learners who need in-person most. We are excited by the fact that the most recently released plan is more creative in meeting the multiple conflicting needs of the schools, many stakeholders, such as teachers, students, families, staff, physical health, social, emotional health, than the prior plans were. While having our children back in school in person would be substantially beneficial for their mental health, for our family sanity, and for our own ability to complete a full workday, we have many questions about it as we contemplate whether to send our own children, fifth and seventh graders, back in person when their schools reopen. Our question falls into three big buckets, which we share for your consideration. Teachers, as you may recall from our previous communications, we firmly believe our teachers are our school's most critical assets. Are teachers on board with this plan? Are they more than on board? Do they feel excited about it? Do they feel physically safe returning with this plan? Will they return rather than quit like so many of their peers around the country are now doing? Do they have adequate time to prepare for their return? To prepare to, prepare to adequately teach children who are unable or unwilling to return in person while also teaching kids in the room? 
Our teachers are already under great strain. Does this plan alleviate or add to that strain? Disruption of learning and routines. Will there be an assessment of the impact of our major program? Schedule changes, an example from distant learning to hybrid learning, last minute decision to lose two days of teacher-led instruction later this week on teachers, students, and families. How about an assessment of the disruption of disrupting the flow of classes midterm? In that same vein, what is the basis for returning to school right before the holidays when people may want to travel to see family and when the risk of infection are likely higher? What happens if a significant portion of teachers or students do not show up to school for the two weeks prior to the holidays because people wish to quarantine before seeing their families? Resource allocation. How realistic is the plan at all given the rise of coronavirus around the country? Sure, Northern Virginia trends are okay at the moment, but as we all know, the situation is incredibly fluid and changing daily. The school's district pivot to district learning in late summer, which I supported, is a classic example of that. And as the superintendent has rightly pointed out, we are not an island and not immune to what is happening, is once again devoting immense resources to a full reopening plan that we may, that may never be realistic, the optimal use of resources right now. Would that time be better spent doubling down on supporting students in distant learning and creating supplemental creative in-person options for students who need it most? I hope and trust you will be digging into all of these questions and more as you continue to assess what is best for our students. Marty, teachers. that's three minutes. Okay, thank you. The next is from Kendra Lee and she writes, I like many others who don't speak up often would like to commend the FCCPS team on their plans to reopen the schools. I have a kindergartner at Mount Daniel and a fourth grader at TJ. My fourth grader wishes he could go back sooner he loves being at school and dearly misses his friends and classmates. And it will be so nice for my kindergartner to actually be in the building of his school to learn. We can't continue to keep living in fear and this is the necessary first step toward our new normal, whatever that might look like. Since Labor Day, my children have been attending the Rec Connect program at the community center without incident while my husband and I are at work. I am very much looking forward to supplementing this with the in-person learning actually in the school building. We can what if ourselves into the ground, but the fact remains, virtual learning is not a long-term solution and it's not the best interest of children. And a hybrid solution gets us moving in the direction that we need to be going in. Staying stagnant and in a state of constant worry is not a long-term solution. And so many strides have been made in science, prevention, treatment, and overall knowledge of this disease. It makes sense for us to move forward along with it. We always say better together, and now's the time to put it into action, what that really means. Thank you again for making the right call, onward and upward, Kendra. The next is on school names from Sean Dakin and he writes, Dear School Board, I think we should change the names. The names should be descriptive and not after people. And he suggests Falls Church City High School, Falls Church City Middle School, Falls Church City Elementary School Upper, Falls Church City Elementary School Lower, Falls Church City Preschool. Best from Sean Dakin, high school student parent. The next is from uh, Linda Becker, Dr. Noonan. We all hope you continue to work toward opening the new high school on January 5th, even if that means bringing back seniors only for the first two weeks in January. Let them lead the way. They have lost so much. Don't take away two more precious weeks of their time together. If the health metrics are favorable, please keep pushing to keep these kids back into the high school on January 5th. We all look forward to an update soon from you to all the students and parents on this matter. Thank you, Linda Becker. The next is from Melissa Teets, and she writes, Dear Chair Anderson and school board members, I'm writing to praise your thoughtful process to explore renaming GMHS and TG, TJES. I also appreciate all the work Superintendent Noonan and his staff has done, especially while dealing with the craziness of COVID-19. I am sure you know where I stand. I believe the name should be changed to better reflect the values of community and to, better, and to have better role models for our children. Ed Henderson wrote a letter to the Falls Church News Press editor last week that sums it up best. The new high school being built in Falls Church should have a new name, one that inspires humanity and decency, as well as one that denounces the sins of the past and crimes against humanity. Our kids should be inspired by the name of our schools. Keeping those names reflects institutional racism. Moving forward and changing the names of the two schools would reflect the spirit of the IB program. Changing the names will show we, as a community, reject racism and the evil of owning another human being. Best, Melissa. The next letter is from Gordon Thies. 
Dear school board, thank you for taking up the school name issue. I support a name change for the high school and the elementary school. Naming Falls Church schools after Virginia founding fathers was abandoned when Mount Daniel Elementary School was built. Founding fathers may have been a fine idea for the 1950s, but in 2020, a name carries with it good, bad, and ugly. Never again should a student have to walk into a building that honors someone who may have owned their ancestors. Our school board has a chance right now to give our world-class schools world-class names. Listen to Falls Church's leader on civic rights issues, Ed Henderson, who wrote, the new high school being built in Falls Church should have a new name, one that inspires humanity and decency, as well as one that denounces the sins of the past and the crimes against humanity. He's right. Move Falls Church away from the past and forward in the new decade. Sincerely, Gordon Thies. The next is on school name consideration for George Mason High School and TJ from Louise Storm. Dear members of the Falls Church City School Board, thank you for your continued service to our community. We appreciate the openness of the school board to consider the timely and crucial matter of whether to rename George Mason High School and Thomas Jefferson. We know there are several concurrent matters that are immensely complicated and pressing. We have the utmost belief in the ability of the board to consider each matter carefully, including this particular one. We are in full support of renaming both schools and are grateful to share our reasoning. Thank you in advance for your time and consideration. To begin, our position is that it would be best to view this question through the eyes of the user, in this case, the student. What we know about Generation Z and the yet unnamed younger generation that populates our preschool and elementary schools is that they are very educated on social justice issues, they are actively involved in expanding equity, and they are impacted by these matters. In quotes, Generation Z represents the leading edge of the country's changing racial and ethnic make makeup. When it comes to race relations, Gen Zers and millennials are about equally likely to say that blacks are treated less fairly than whites in this country. The source is from Pew Research Group. In quotes, around the world, we are seeing children and youth engage as social, political, and economic actors, demonstrating their capacity to help make social change, says author Jessica Taft in the author of Rebel Girls. Further, we know naming schools has an impact on black and brown students as well as ed educators alike. In the 2019 dissertation, the perceptions and effects of school names on black professional educators and their students, she says to see the abstract. We also know that children of all races are impacted by observing racism. In quotes, recognizing that racism has significant adverse effects on the individual who receives, commits, and observes racism, substantial investments in dismantling structural racism are required to facilitate the societal shifts necessary for optimal development of children in the United States. The source, Pediatrics Official Journey of the American Academy of Pediatrics in the Impact of Racism on Child and Adolescent Health. Two, we know that involvement in acti activism is, has a beneficial impact on children, in quotes. Results found that even young children could successfully and meaningfully participate in these school-based activism projects. Additionally, students' participation in these projects was characterized by a high level of enthusiasm and also facilitated a sense of community empowerment in these children. The source, Sage Journal, Children as Agents of the Social and Community Change enhancing youth empowerment through participation in a school-based social activism pro project. We can all agree that actions are often more important than words. Renaming our schools demonstrates in a clear, tangible, and immediate way our shared commitment to anti-racism. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I think I was, um, anyway, I'll continue. Uh, the next is from Charles Crum. This summer, the superintendent stated that if people in Falls Church practiced social distancing and had low infection rates, we would go back to hybrid in-person education in the fall. The residents of Falls Church responded by having the far the lowest COVID-19 rate of any location in Northern Virginia. However, after Fairfax County went remote, Falls Church immediately followed. Fairfax County is a gigantic school system with a very complicated mix of students in individual high schools that have more students than the entire Falls Church school system combined. In fact, the Fairfax County public school system is more than 71 times the size of FCCPS. There are things we can and should have done that Fairfax simply cannot do. 
The low COVID-19 rates in Falls Church were partially acknowledged in the September 18th email, but the fact is our local rates have been consistently low from the summer through now. The location where our students live is not having a serious problem at this point, but the school system seems to be responding like it does and the metrics for reopening do not reflect our unique situation. This needs to change. There are similar public and private schools across the country successfully operating in-person education right now. The time and energies of the superintendent and the school board should be focused on following those successes and learning from them, rather than pointing out the COVID-19 rate in neighboring areas of Virginia. Today is October 13th. January 21st is more than three months away, which is longer than the summer break. There has been much historical research into the learning loss that occurs each summer, and recently there has been research into the COVID-19 learning loss from canceled and remote classes. It is time we address the core issue of in-person education head on. There is no reason that middle and high school classes couldn't have been operating in some form of hybrid model all along, given that we are in such a safe locality, but we are where we are. I ask that you return middle and high school students to the class as soon as possible, and certainly at least on January 4th, when the new building is available after the winter break. Thank you, Charles Crum. The next is on process and financial aspects of the school renaming. And this is from Tom Johnson. One, the process. The school board has decided to send a survey to all current MEH and GMHS students, parents, and staff. But that is only a small fraction of those involved in the 70 year history of George Mason High School. The board has not made clear how it plans to reach the much larger community of interested parties, alumni, current taxpayers, former faculty and staff and their families, formal residents and others. The board already has the contact information for all those who have thus far submitted public comments or otherwise participated in the, in the renaming debate. So at, at the very least, the survey should be sent to all those parties. Otherwise, the board would be directly soliciting input only from the many who have not taken the time to participate in the process, but not from those who have. And to reach members of the aforementioned larger community who have not yet participated, what are the board's plans beyond announcements in the local newspaper, which is essential, but would be inadequate. Two, the financial aspects. In the survey on possible name changes to George Mason High School and Thomas Jefferson Elementary School, the taxpayers of Falls Church have a right to be informed of precisely what additional cuts would be made to the current FCCPS budget and or how any additional funds would be raised to finance any name changes. In other words, the taxpayers must be told that either there is a sum zero situation in which name changes would be funded from additional taxes or from a further reduction in educational activities, in addition to the 2.4 million already cut from the FCCPS budget. The taxpayers should be told exactly what educational activities or expenditures would be sacrificed. In addition, the survey should present the option, if the board decides to change any school names, of only actually doing so if they would be totally financed by private donations. In short, the survey should include a detailed and itemized list of essential costs as well as the sources or the line items from the current FCC PS budget for any expenditures on renaming for both schools. This information should include, but not limited to, the cost of consultant to date, the estimated final cost of the consultant or the maximum possible cost under the contract, stationary forms, transcripts, diplomas, awards, and other administrative expenses, cost of new athletic uniforms and coaches gear for all teams, cost of replacing athletic or other furniture equipment with George Mason High School name, cost to school affiliated organizations, for example, the athletic boosters inventory of the George Mason High School spirit wear and other items, IT costs for changing the main and athletic websites, signage, an example on the exterior of TJ, the cost of filings or other expenditures with the federal government, state agencies and national organizations, college board, ACT, et cetera. Cost of filings or other expenditures with the IB program and advertising or other communications expenses in connection with the survey or related matters. And the last is to uh, no changes to school names from Dave Hagee. Dear school board members, we want to express our strong opposition to the idea of changing the names of Thomas Jefferson Elementary and George Mason High School. There are a number of reasons not to do this, but arguably one of the most important one is the cost of such a move. In light of the financial damage caused by the coronavirus, why would the city willingly make a change that is lacking in substance, but has real financial cost? As a longtime member of the athletic boosters, Dave is very aware of the cost associated with the name change, mainly the high, for the high school. 
There are hundreds of thousands of dollars of uniforms and spirit wear that would have to be replaced. Boosters exist solely to support the Mason Athletic Department with supplemental funding and to help those families that have trouble with athletic fees, equipment, and off-season training camps. It would take several years for the boosters to make up for the loss associated ordering all new spirit wear. There have been no games played since mid-March and thus boosters have raised no money for, from concessions. Furthermore, we have no idea when BHSL will allow games to begin again in the coming months. It's easy to assume attendance will take a while to get back to normal, and that means less money being raised. We also rely on sponsorships from local businesses that will definitely be impacted by the pandemic. Lastly, this does not even include the cost of the city to replace signage in the schools. We're not talking about a small amount of funds here. We understand the school board plans on doing a survey to get citizen input. While obviously current parents should have a say, so should alums and city residents who no longer have kids in the school like us. The board should make every effort to include as many opinions as possible. Also, I would hope that the survey would spell out the cost associated with a name change, especially in light of the cuts that are expected due to the pandemic. I suspect many people are unaware of these costs and thus should be told prior to responding to a survey. We appreciate your consideration and trust the right decision. No name change is made in the coming months. Best regards, Dave Hagee and Ellen McRae. And that's, that's all I have. Thank you very much, Ms. Goodell. Um, and thank you to everyone who uh, took the time to write to us, share your perspectives on, uh, on renaming, reopening, and so on. We listen to it. We read every single comment that comes in, and we really do appreciate you engaging with us. So thank you. So we'll move on now to the next item on our agenda, um, which is uh, 3.01, um, a closed meeting. And I would seek a, uh, a motion regarding that meeting. Pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose to discuss or consider the identified subject matter. Personnel under section 2.2-3711A1, in particular staff appointments, staff reassignments, staff resignations, staff retirement, staff performance, staff change of position, staff termination, dependent care leave, long-term medical leave, child care leave requests, and leave of absence, and advisory committee appointments. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Uh, Ms. Goodell. Yes. Um, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimmick. Yes. Ms. Downs. Yes. Ms. Litton. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. Yes. Ms. Russell. Yes. And Mr. Webb. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so members, we need to move over to the other uh, Zoom link and everyone else, we will uh, be back as, as uh, soon as we're done with our discussion here. Um, Dr. Noonan, I think we're talking 10-ish minutes. You're on mute, I believe. I think after all this time, I'd have it figured out. Um, we'll be 10 or 15 minutes at the most, probably. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will be back. All right. I think we have... They're all looking at you. They're looking at you. Looking back. to see that we have everybody in the meeting at this point, and I think we do. So at this point, I would... Uh, uh, seek a motion reconvening us to open. Mr. Chair, I move us, move that the board reconvene and open. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Litton. Uh, Ms. Goodell? Uh, yes. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. And Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We are reconvened back into open session. And at this point, I would seek a motion certifying our closed meeting. Uh, Dr. Dimmick. Whereas the Falls Church City School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas section 2.2-3711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the school board 
that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City School Board hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirement by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the meeting, convening the closed meeting, were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Dr. Dimick. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Ms. Godot. Yes, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. And Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, we now move on to um, item 5.01. We have a couple of recognitions and reports that we would like to do. We'd like to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Benson and Mr. Delaney to, uh, to the meeting for recognition that the board actually approved and adopted a resolution, um, the 2020 VSBA media honor roll resolutions 0620 and 0720 back in July. But now uh, we have the opportunity to present, uh, present you in a virtual socially distanced sort of a way with the certificates commemorating the awards themselves. And I would just like to read each one of them um, for Mr. Benton and for uh, Mr. Delaney and, and start with uh, Mr. Benton's and just note here, uh, the Virginia School Board Association's 2020 Media Honor Roll Program honoring Nicholas Benton, Falls Church News Press. The Falls Church City School Board recognizes your fair and balanced reporting on school division and education related topics. Your work has aided this community in focusing on the goal of providing the best public schools we can for the students who attend them. Uh, and Dr. Noonan is kindly holding up the actual certificate, which Mr. Benton, we will work to, uh, to get to you as soon as we can. So thank you everybody and, and congratulations. Thank you. And then Mr. Delaney, we also of course would like to honor you as well and say thank you. Uh, and I will read your, uh, your certificate as well. And Virginia School Board Association's 2020 Media Honor Roll Program honoring Matt Delaney, Falls Church News Press. And the Falls Church City School Board recognizes your fair and balanced reporting on school division and education related topics. Your work has aided this community in focusing on the goal of providing the best public schools we can for the students who attend them. And Dr. Noonan again is doing the honors of holding up the actual certificate and we will get this to you as soon as we can. So thank you very much, both of you and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you guys. I will just, congratulations, uh, Matt. we just put a uh, recently added a about us section on our website. And uh, given we're in our 30th year of consecutive weekly publication of the news press in the city of Falls Church, I just uh, would note that editorially, the news press advances a pro-equality and public education perspective that recognizes the need for robust economic development as a vital means to sustain that. So that's, uh, that's the, what fair and balanced means to us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And we do appreciate your work. Um, and I don't know, Dr. Noonan, is it possible to get a picture, which we would normally do in person? Can we just take a shot and share that in some fashion? Uh, uh, Peter, just come on Absol over here. We're, we're just down the Absolutely. I can, I'd be happy to do that. And I'm, I'm sorry will, uh, that, that I had not actually said that earlier. It literally occurred to me as we were sitting here that we, we should try to do this. Okay. So on three, everybody's going to smile or wave. Ready? One, two, three. Nice. Okay. I will get that up on uh, Twitter tonight and be sure to tag at, at FCNP. All Thank right. you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much and, Thanks, uh, and congratulations. All right. I believe that um, there are some additional recognitions, Dr. Noonan, I think um, you have for us. That, um... There are some additional recognitions and uh, I have the distinct honor and pleasure this evening to recognize our school board members for um, their outstanding work, um, continuing your own educational process uh, and continuing with your learning with the Virginia School Boards Association. And uh, I will uh, read this certificate as I um, award each one to you. Um, but the first one goes to Greg Anderson. And Greg, it comes from the, from the Virginia School Boards Association Award of Achievement 
um, awarded to Gregory John Anderson for your commitment to effective school board governance through your participation in the VSBA Board Academy for 2019 and 2020. This is your certificate. And you also, uh, because of your work with the VSBA, have earned a bronze, um, a, a, a bronze pin as well. So we will make sure that you get your bronze pin and your certificate uh, as soon as we get back. Um, the next award goes to Dr. Dimmick. Um, so Dr. Dimmick, this uh, award is presented to you for your commitment to effective school board governance through your participation in the VSBA Board Academy as well for 2019 and 2020. Thank you very much for your great service and your continued learning as well. The next award uh, goes to uh, Shannon Litton. And Shannon, same thing, it's for your commitment to effective board governance through your participation in the board academy, the VSBA School Board Academy. And in addition to your um, certificate, because of the extra hours you've earned, you've, you've gotten a silver uh, pin coming your way. So congratulations on your silver pen. Uh, and you can add that to your, to your, your pin collection. Um, Mr. Reidinger, congratulations to you as well for your commitment to effective school board governance through your participation in the VSBA School Board Academy 2019 and 2020. And your certificate is right here. So congratulations to you. Shauna Russell, Ms. Russell, congratulations to you for your commitment also through the VSBA Board Academy for 2019 and 2020. And in addition to your certificate, um, you uh, have earned a bronze uh, pin as well. So congratulations on your bronze pin and we will make sure that you get that. And last but not least, uh, Lawrence Webb, um, congratulations to you for your commitment to effective board governance through your participation in the VSBA Board Academy 2019-2020. And in addition to your certificate, you have earned a silver pin. So we will make sure that you get your silver pin uh, to go with your pin collection as well. So um, just on behalf of, um, I won't speak on behalf of VSBA, but I will speak on behalf of myself. And that is to say that we have um, always committed ourselves, I believe, to being a learning organization. And through your efforts, um, by continuing with your professional development through the Virginia School Boards Association and in other ways, you continue to model, I think, what is excellence of school boards around governance and also about learning. So just want to publicly say thank you for continuing to hone your skills uh, to become better school board members because as you do that, you make all of us better. So thank you very much and congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Um, and I will just take a moment to say thank you to my colleagues for continuing uh, your professional development and, and uh, continuing to improve as board members and, and keep ourselves going. So thank you all. Um, and we'll work on uh, work on how to actually get the get things to us all later. But that's uh, again, congratulations and thanks. Um, so at this point, we will move on to six point oh one, um, our consent agenda. And um, again, because we are meeting in um, uh, in electronic mode here, we do need to take a voice vote. And so we're on six point oh three. Um, we do need to take an actual roll call vote. So I will seek a motion regarding the consent agenda. Mr. Chair, I <clears throat> move the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Mr. Reidinger. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Litton. Ms. Goodell. Yes, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimmick. Yes. Ms. Downs. Yes. Ms. Litton. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. And Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you, and it passes. All right, thank you everyone. Um, that brings us now to our business and action items uh, for tonight's agenda. And I do wanna to pause to say uh, welcome on behalf of the board to some very special guests tonight. We have um, both principal and assistant principal for uh, Mount Daniel and uh, TJ with us. And thank you all, all for being here. Um, we are looking forward to hearing about the update on the school reopening plans for, and, uh, and going from there. And we're very glad you can join us. So thanks for your time uh, tonight to be here. And Dr. Noonan, I think I would like to turn this, uh, turn this over to you after, sorry, just one thing I will say is 
We're gonna have a presentation. There are pause points built in where we will ask questions as we've, as we've done before on these sorts of presentations. I'll go uh, in an order, uh, alphabetical order on my screen and just sort of ask everyone for their questions uh, and, and we'll keep on going with the next section, more questions and so on. So um, that's basically the plan for this next segment. So Dr. Noonan, I'd like to, to hand this to you now. Thank you, Chair Anderson, and good evening, members of the board. Nice to see all of you again uh, and have an opportunity this evening to um, speak to you about the elementary reopening plan uh, that has been developed um, over the course of the last uh, month or so um, on behalf of our uh, K-12 or K-6 students. Um, like you, Chair Anderson, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome our two elementary principals, um, Paul Swanson and Tim Kasich along with their incredible assistant principals, Amanda Davis and Jeremy Ferrara, respectively. Um, they are our leadership on the ground, so to speak, and have been working diligently on behalf of um, our school division and on behalf of their staff, sort of in an interesting position to really support um, the efforts and the vision of, of their school and of the division at the same time. Um, and that in some, some cases can be a challenge and both of them have, um, or all four of them have taken on these challenges incredibly well and really embraced them. Um, so th this evening, as Chair Anderson indicated, um, we do have some pause points along the way and hopefully had a chance to review the presentation prior to us delivering it tonight. So um, it, it may be helpful to kind of know what's coming up, um, but there are three points um, in the presentation that we would like to sort of stop and ask uh, you all if you have any questions. Um, as we as we move ahead, so let me let me go ahead and begin um, with the first um, slide being that first of all, first and foremost, how grateful we are um, not only to our staff and our faculty, but to everyone across the division, parents, um, students, and the like, uh, for all that they've done during this incredible time. Um, we're no longer saying unprecedented. I think that's out of our vocabulary, um, but we are working on uh, really incredible times. And so tonight. Um, this presentation, um, we hope, will go relatively quickly um, for you. Uh, we'll provide some information on some updates with respect to health metrics, special populations reopening, and then reviewing the elementary reopening plan for Thomas Jefferson and Mount Daniel. Um, the way that we're going to handle the presentation tonight is that I'll take the first two sections of the presentation, and then Rebecca Sharp, our Empress of COVID, will take the third um, section, but again, um, our principals are here uh, and we are here to answer any questions that you might have. So um, as we've approached every stage in our reopening, um, we have really tried to stick to um, the words of Dr. King, which are the time is always right to do what is right. Um, and we have consistently um, stated throughout the process and truly emphasized that all of our decisions will be made on um, the basis of health, um, and also um, knowing that we don't know everything that's out there. So all we can do is look at the health uh, metrics that we, that we can see, we can look at um, the safety, we can take feedback from our sta stakeholders, we can look for stability and support for our workforce, which is an absolute necessity for any plan going forward. Um, and then as always, we continue to maintain and stay in very close contact um, with uh, the Virginia Department of Health, um, the Fairfax County Health Department, which is our health district, um, the Virginia Department of Education, and then also along with my colleagues from around the region. And I'd, I'd like to respond to um, some of the comments that have been made um, just to say that we are a small school division and we recognize that. And because of it, we are able to be much more nimble than other larger school divisions. Um, and as a consequence of that, we are doing some things that are remarkably different, I think, than other surrounding jurisdictions right now. Uh, and the path that we are on um, is one that actually gets our elementary kids back um, more quickly than other school divisions. And that's not the goal. It's not at all to be a challenge because we want to do it safely and we want to do it effectively. Um, but I also uh, want to just sort of let everyone know that we are, uh, as much as we want to maintain that regional, um, uh, that regional approach, unfortunately, many of the school divisions in the region have gone a different way. And as a consequence of that, uh, we, we now are focused uh, really on what is right for the City of Falls Church. So some health data just to sort of reorient you um, that I think is really important. Uh, and this comes from the Fairfax County Health District. And again, we meet with them once a week. There are um, 
very encouraging signs with respect to COVID-19 in this region. Um, and at the moment, there is no sign of any kind of surge. Um, and, and we are not looking at um, really bad metrics at all. In fact, the overall composite, which comes from the Virginia Department of Health, which I've briefed you all on previously, uh, remains low. Um, our burden composite uh, is low. Our trend composite is decreasing. And the number of cases per 100,000 is 6.9, leaving us a positivity rate of 4.2%. Um, so that has been something that we have been really happy about. And, and I think one of the things that we can be really proud of um, as a region is that we seem to be following as best possible um, much of the guidance that has been provided by CDC, the Virginia Department of Health, and others with respect to some of these key um, mitigation strategies. So I want to um, just talk for a second about today um, and last week, but let me start with today um, because I think if you were to ask anyone on this call, um, they truly would say that their, their heart is full. Um, and their heart is full like mine is uh, because today we welcomed back the largest group of students that we've had come back so far. Um, and as the students walked into the building, I had the fortune of, we all split up where we were gonna start the day and I had the good fortune of being at Jesse Thackeray Preschool and welcoming 32 of our preschool students back um, and seeing the excitement in the eyes of our littlest and, and youngest learners was really something very special. Uh, I was sharing with Dr. Anderson before the meeting that um, we have students that went to Jesse Thackeray last year who came to the front door and were ready to walk straight in the door and actually had to be told, no, 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 we're going to go in the side door. We're going to go in the side door. And the kids were like, nope, this is the door we go in and we're always going to go in this way and trying to redirect kids through some behaviors that they knew just because they've become um, accustomed to school was pretty, uh, pretty exciting to watch. Um, I know that there were folks at Mount Daniel and at Thomas Jefferson as well, and Danny the Hippo was out and the Tiger was out today um, welcoming students and, and uh, all of us were out on the ground um, trying to make sure that we had a really great opening and, and for all intents and purposes today was quite special. Um, I did get a chance to get to the ESOL program over at the middle school as well, um, and our ESOL learners are learning up in the media center, our middle and high school, uh, and, and doing extraordinarily well. And so. Uh, last week uh, on Tuesday was the first day that we started sort of wave one and we completed wave one today. Uh, and last week we started with our secondary um, student uh, in our life skills uh, classes and our therapeutic day classes. And our students are, are just knocking it out of the park. Um, I think I may have mentioned in the last, maybe the last time we were together, one of the students walked through the front door, raised his hands over his head and said, finally, uh, as he walked into school because he was so ready to be back at school. So our kids are excited. Um, our teachers are excited. Today I saw tears, literally tears in the eyes of two of our teachers as kids walked in the building because it was an emotional moment for our folks to, to see kids again. And uh, it was very, very, made us all very happy. So let me talk a little bit about um, where, where we go from here. And this has sort of become affectionately known um, as wave two um, and, and reopening of K-5. Uh, and so one of the things I wanna just lead in this conversation with is that this has been a, a really significant collaboration and engagement with our teachers and our staff teams at both Mount Daniel and Thomas Jefferson. And I wanna commend the two administrative teams at both of those schools for the work that they did because the, the lift of, of getting everyone together and trying to come to consensus agreement around um, what, the, what the school days and the, the master schedule was gonna look like was not um, an easy challenge, uh, but each of the administrative teams in both of the respective schools, along with teacher leaders and the like, really um, did the hard work of sort of digging in, listening deeply, listening intently, and then coming out the other side with something that was a strong collaboration. In addition to hearing our teachers and staff voices that way, um, I also held a town hall meeting with all of the, a virtual town hall meeting with all of the staff at, at each Mount Daniel and Thomas Jefferson both at the same time. Uh, there were a number of teacher leader meetings. Um, there were team meetings. There were role group meetings where we had school counselors together or school social workers together or related service providers together. Um, and, and they all held these school-based planning sessions. We did extensive question and answer sessions. 
um, at the school site and provided a lot of individual feedback to teachers that have questions. So there are some key features that came out of those conversations that I want to share with you that were also shared in the Friday update to the community. Um, and the first is that we are adopting a half day format. And this is a, this is a, a direct outgrowth of teacher feedback. Um, our original plan, as you may recall, was two days on, two days off. So students were having two full days of instruction. We'd go home for two days and then have a, uh, another day where they wouldn't be coming in. So it was really like five days off. Our teachers were quite adamant that they wanted to have uh, all of their students every day. And I think part of that is driven by the fact that our teachers, as much as our parents miss our teachers, our teachers miss our kids. Uh, and as much as our kids miss our, miss our teachers, our teachers miss our kids as well. So um, out of that half day format be, uh, be, became AM and PM groupings. So the schedule for return for us is that on November 10th, um, which is the Tuesday after the week of the election, um, and, and Mr. Reitinger, we were thoughtful about your comment at our last meeting um, about keeping something too close to the election. Also, our teachers wanted us to have an opportunity to do a deeper cleaning at Thomas Jefferson, which is also a poll site following the national election. We did move that return date to November 10th. And on November 10th, we, were, we are excited to welcome back our kindergarten classrooms and our third grade classrooms. And then we had intended originally, you may recall, of sort of meeting out, if you will, um, after kindergarten would be first grade and fourth grade, and then after that would be second grade and fifth grade. And our teachers said, uh, and staff said, we really want to have all of our kids back by November 17th. And so um, the following week after November 10th, when we bring K and three back on November 17th, we will bring back our first and second grade and also our fourth and fifth grade. Um, and everyone really has worked tremendously to sort of make this happen and for us all to come together. So um, with respect to the actual reopening plan itself, um, what, what we're looking at are two options and our parents um, are engaged in this option and have been engaged in this option, this option choosing now for several days because we have put out um, a, a request uh, of them to give us what their intention is. Um, but the two options that we are providing for our K through six students or K through five students is option one would be a hybrid instructional model. So that would be a combination of in-person learning and online learning. And then the second option is anyone who is not comfortable sending their students back would remain in the virtual instructional model 100% of the time. And again, on the right side of the slide, we share um, the timeline for return again. But let me share with you just a little bit of information in a side-by-side -side look when we look at um, the hybrid learning environment versus the all virtual uh, environment. And, and let me also be clear that um, for many of our students, the all virtual learning environment has worked rather successfully. Um, we have a number of our kids and a number of our parents who have really enjoyed it and feel comfortable with it um, and maybe aren't ready to move back. And, and that's totally fine. Um, this is a personal decision by family and we want to allow those families to have the option of making a good decision. But a good decision starts with who am I going to have at the elementary level? That is the topic of conversation every summer around the swimming pool. Um, and it is the topic of conversation as life goes on in elementary. And the one thing that we want to verify and assure our parents of is that regardless of the solution that you select, whether you come back in the hybrid learning environment or the all virtual environment, you will remain with your current teacher and with your current class. The timing of the day may be different, but you will remain with your current teacher and your current class. That was something that we heard very loudly and clearly from our parent community and something we also heard from our staff community saying they wanted to keep their kids. So in the hybrid learning solution, we really are looking at Tuesday through Friday um, at half days in the school building and half days in the virtual setting. And students would access in half of the day their core curriculum in person with their classroom teacher that they've had all year. And the other half of the day they would receive their encore instruction and some other um, social emotional learning activities and some other choice activities. 
Monday would remain as an independent learning day with live instruction uh, with our teachers for the first 20 to 30 minutes in the morning. So teachers will run a Monday morning meeting with all of their kids to kind of connect, reconnect, um, say hello, kind of map out what the week's gonna look like. And then um, students would have independent learning on that Monday. And then Tuesday through Friday, they'd be either half day in the building um, or half day at home each day. Um, students assigned to either the morning or the afternoon in person is going to be based on last name. And I wanna talk just a minute about that because it's really important um, that our community understand what we're trying to accomplish and achieve here. Um, by grouping our students by last name, we, were able, we are able to adequately serve um, our students by family and allows us to, to better contact trace. It allows us to, in case there is a need to do contact tracing, it allows us to maintain our bubble, if you will, better in the City of Falls Church, and it allows us uh, to also support transportation needs. So what we do know about transportation, for example, is that, that families can sit together uh, on the bus. So right now, what we are uh, able to transport is about 20 students per bus, and that's one student per seat. But if we're busing families at a time, as opposed to students that aren't families, it increases our ability to transport students uh, as a family. I wanna comment here also just quickly, um, and, and you may recall early during the pandemic, um, we received information from families who were requesting uh, us to support potting or support um, teaming up of kids. And at that point early in the pandemic, we said that we weren't going to support potting or support teaming of kids because we knew that when we came back together in person, it would be um, a, a very difficult logistical um, problem for us to solve to keep kids in pods. And so we are not going to honor pods um, through the hybrid learning AMPM um, solution. Uh, and that is because we need to keep families together for a variety of reasons for contact tracing and the bubble and for transportation. Um, and then the last bullet here is that live virtual instruction with current classroom teachers um, if students have to be out of school for any reason. So in other words, if a student is asked to stay home because they've been sick, um, they would continue to be able to receive instruction from their teacher from their classroom. In the all virtual learning environment, students again will remain with their current teacher. They'll have, have access to core curriculum via a live feed from the classroom. So our teachers have adopted the model where they are going to utilize the streaming cameras that we have available, the AVER cameras. Um, and so students will be able to access their core curriculum from their classroom teacher through one of our AVER cameras, Tuesday through Friday in half day virtual sessions, Monday. The FCCPS elementary intention form um, and availability. I see that my internet connection is unstable. Are, are you hearing me okay? Yes, okay. Um, and let me speak to that last bullet to make sure that that's clear too, because I wanna make sure that everyone understands. Um, so we, we know that we are going to have a core group of students that are going to select virtual instruction, for example, and this is just an example, in kindergarten and in first grade. So kindergarten and first grade might be sharing AVER cameras. So that means that all of our kids that are getting virtual instruction might be in the AM so that the kindergarten teachers can share those AVER cameras. And then the first graders would be in the PM so that the AVER cameras could then move to the classroom of the first grade teachers. That's an example, but I wanna make sure that everybody understands the methodology around the placement of AM PM at the elementary school is because of the placement of those AVER cameras for students who are all virtual and online. And to be clear again, everyone will maintain their classroom teacher. They will, they will just receive that instruction through the AVER cameras and online. So let me show you a little bit of what it looks like at a glance, because in the abstract, it's a little bit hard to sort of figure out. So you have student one and student two on Tuesday through Friday. Um, and and this, is the, this is the big picture here, right? 
So one of the things that's really nice about seeing this big picture is we don't have down to the minute when is morning meeting, when is mass, when is recess, when is language arts, when is social studies. We are still garnering feedback at the school level around how that schedule is going to work best. So, so Mr. Dr. Swanson and Mr. Kasich, along with their administrative team, continue to work. So student one is a hybrid student. So student one, let's say I'm in fourth grade. I am going to come in in the morning and I'm going to be there at 8.50 and I'm going to stay till 11.50. And during that period of time, I'm going to have morning meeting, math, recess, language arts, and social studies. Not necessarily in that order, but that is going to be my core instruction day face-to-face. -face. Then I'm going to go home from 11.50 to 12.50. There's a break. It's an opportunity for our students to eat lunch um, and also for us to be able to clean the classrooms that students have just left. Then once I get home, I'm gonna fire up my, my computer just like I have been all year. And from 12.50 to 3.50, students will receive their Encore instruction. So as a reminder of Encore, it's PE, it's Spanish, it's library, it's music, it's art, all of these different things. And then I may have some choice activities as well that go along with that. So there might be some online work, some other things. But um, students will receive their Encore program online in the afternoon. If I'm a hybrid morning Encore student, meaning that I'm going to take my Encore classes in the morning, then at 8.50 in the morning, I'm going to log in. I'm going to get my PE, my art, my music, whatever the schedule is for that day, some independent work, and then I'm going to catch the bus or I'm going to walk to school or my parents are going to drive me to school or however I'm going to get there. And then from 12.50 to 3.50, I will get my core instruction face-to-face -face with my, my regular teacher that I've had all year. So that's a hybrid day at a glance. Let me share with you what a, a virtual day at a glance looks like. So not surprising, it looks exactly the same. The only difference is that in the virtual, the student doesn't come to school. So instead of, if, you, if we were to assume that this were an AVER camera, Instead of you sitting in front of me, you would be online and I would be teaching mathematics to my students. If you were a morning virtual student, I might have you. I might be talking to you about the morning meeting. I might do, be doing some math problems on the board behind me. But whatever the case may be, you'll be getting your instruction from me through the virtual environment while I have my live students in front of me. And then at 11.50 to 12.50, you're going to get a break as a virtual student. And then at 12.50 to 3.50, you're going to come back online and you're gonna get your encore. So you're gonna get your PE, art, music, and the like. If you're a virtual student uh, with the core curriculum in the afternoon, you're gonna get your PE, art, music, and the like in the morning, you're gonna get a lunch break, and then you're gonna get your teacher of record in the afternoon from 12.50 to 3.50 to provide that core instruction. Um, some questions have come up about, well, what does Monday look like? So we know, we know one of the things that our students have really struggled with, and, and the adults, quite frankly, um, are some of the social emotional issues that have arisen over this pandemic. Um, and, and we talk a lot about social emotional learning, our school counselors, our social workers, our school psychologists have been deeply working on this as well. Um, so Monday is gonna be a day where we're gonna have an opportunity to work with our kids on some of our social emotional learning activities. Some of the independent study that they may be engaged in are activities on Dreambox, we've got My on Reading, Pioneer Valley, and the like, so students can work on their independent skills. And then in some cases where students need some extra intervention, so if I'm struggling in mathematics, I may be able to see a specialist in mathematics to help support my math instruction on that Monday. So I might be invited to come in for a half an hour window or whatever the case may be to work specifically with a specialist. If I'm an ESOL student, I might meet with my ESOL teacher for a while. Special ed students might meet with their special ed kids and then we'll provide gifted services on those Mondays as well, um, but more in an individualized or small group manner. So Monday is gonna be meaningful. It's just gonna be meaningful a little bit differently than what the Tuesday through Friday looks like as we move ahead. So um, I hearken back to some comments that um, Mr. Reitinger made early on um, and that is that we need to remain super flexible. And I think that this um, plan and this course of action provides for us the most flexibility that there is possible. 
because our teachers have adopted the live streaming from their classrooms and that provides continuity of support. So our teachers will be using those um, streaming cameras um, through Schoology Conference and students uh, will also have the opportunity to see the lesson because it will be recorded. Um, so if something happens and they have a doctor's appointment or they have something else going on, uh, it will be record recorded as well. Um, but the other part of this that I think is absolutely critical is that by streaming classrooms and students maintaining their regular schedule, scheduled teacher, if, for example, there's a need to pause, and we'll talk more about what a pause is in a minute, we can go right back into streaming or right back into online instruction, just, just like that. So if a class has to go out for a reason for two days to take a pause, that class can continue with online learning. The teacher can do it from their classroom with the streaming, or they could go back in through Schoology like they have been um, normally. If I, as an individual, have to quarantine for some reason, I, I may be at home quarantining, but I won't miss my instruction because I'll be able to observe the stream um, as my teacher continues to work through um, their instructional program. So, so the streaming option for us is, is something that I think is gonna provide us the most flexibility and it doesn't necessitate stopping instruction. And that, by the way, was one of the drawbacks of the two days on, two days off, was that students on those two days that they were off would have independent learning for those two days. And now knowing that we're gonna see kids four days in a row and we're gonna see them you know, online as well, we're gonna have an opportunity to maintain the momentum of instruction. So, so what has gone out is a learning intention form um, to our community. Uh, we, we gave, I think, a very comprehensive overview last week of what the online versus hybrid solution looks like. And so we're asking all of our parents to complete the online um, uh, intention form by October 19th. And we're asking parents to choose either hybrid or virtual, and we're asking questions about transportation and breakfast and lunch. And I wanted to give you just a little bit of information tonight. Um, these are the most up-to-date statistics that we have. I've been, I, I feel like I watch a, I'm watching a stock ticker every minute um, watching this Google form. But right now um, we have 232 responses from Thomas Jefferson um, and we need 535. That's the magic number at TJ. So we're um, a little less than halfway there. And at Mount Daniel, we have 160 responses and we're looking for 463. So our total number of responses that we're looking for is 998. And right now we have 392. So we are um, about a third of the way with our responses. So thanks to everyone who has provided that information to us. We really appreciate it. Um, some information that we've gotten about lunches, just so that you know, and, and I'll talk more about food in a minute, is that of the folks that have responded, 70% um, have said that they would not need a bagged lunch um, and about 30% have said that they would need a bagged lunch. That was one of the questions that we asked. And then with respect to the model selection, currently um, out of the, the 392 responses, 83% have responded that they would like to stay in the hybrid or would like to come to the hybrid. And 17% um, have responded that they wanna stay virtual. So we, we um, tried to estimate what those numbers would be. And I think we're pretty close. Um, that we, we thought it was gonna be somewhere between 15 and 20%, but the numbers are early. We don't know actually what it's gonna look like in the end, but right now 83% of those that have responded wanna come back to the hybrid. Um, we did also ask the question about residing in a walk zone. And if you resided in a walk zone, um, will you be able to provide transportation for your student? Um, because we did expand those walk zones a little bit and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Um, we have 178, which is 45%, have said yes, they'll be able to provide uh, transportation. And we have 151 who have said it's not applicable and 63 families who said that even though they live in a walk zone, they wouldn't be able to provide transportation, but that doesn't mean that those students won't walk. So we'll, we'll follow up with those families that um, fill out the, the survey appropriately through our transportation office. And then the last question that we asked is, if you don't reside in a walk zone, will you need bus transportation for your students? Um, because if we have less students that don't need busing, we can fit, you know, we can, we can accommodate more kids potentially on the bus. And right now, um, yes, we have 138% uh, said that they need transportation to and from. 
that's 150 out of 392, um, and 147 have said that they would not need uh, transportation, and the rest have said that it's not applicable. So I threw a lot of information at you data-wise um, that you don't have in front of you necessarily, but I did want to let you know that um, sort of from a top level, um, the vast majority of our families are selecting to come back to the hybrid, um, and and uh, many are choosing to um, to provide their own transportation, and that that actually will be helpful to us in the end. So um, I talked about the next slide a little bit, um, but I I want to just reiterate that students are grouped by last name and by household for in-person learning um, to support the health and all of those operational considerations that I talked about. So the break for us in terms of numbers, because remember this is really a numbers game and making sure we have the right number of kids in the classroom at a time, is that A through K would be in the AM and L through Z would be in the PM. Um, and we are gonna make very few adjustments to that. Um, and those that we do make will actually support our operations. And, and I know that that's going to create some um, concern among some of our families, but it's really important to us that we try to maintain that break in alphabet uh, as best we can, because from an operational standpoint and also from a contact tracing standpoint and a bubble standpoint, it's really important that we, um, that we follow that. So um, that leads us to our first break in the action here. Um, so Mr. Anderson, we, we have a team of people here that are ready, willing, and able to answer any questions leading up to this. And then we have two other sections to go. So any questions that, that you all may have that we can take on. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Um, so I would like to ask members um, who have questions on this first section uh, to, to ask your questions here. Um, I've been encouraged to experiment with just opening it up rather than going around the, uh, around the table to see how that goes. So we'll try that. Uh, and I, will, I see Ms. Downs has her hand up, so I will go to her. And then I see Dr. Dimmick. Thank you, Chair Anderson, and thank you, Dr. Noonan. Uh, this is actually a comment I, or a compliment. I just wanted to, I've heard from a few community members who really appreciated that we are going to give them a chance in January um, if they wanted to change their selection. Um, I know that some families are quarantining over the holidays, um, but may want to consider going hybrid you know, in the new year. So thank you for that flexibility. Absolutely, and we, we would welcome um, those students back at any point um, around uh, after the break. Um, the other thing that uh, is happening right now, just for the good of the board, is that um, tomorrow phone calls begin to all of the families who've decided to homeschool this year to see if they would like to come back as well. So um, now that we're coming back, because a lot of people put in their letters for homeschooling that they would come back when school began again, and so the elementary school is beginning again. So we'd like to give them that opportunity to come back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Downs. And Dr. Dimmick, I saw you had your hand up and I'm gonna scroll up and down looking for others. Hi, thanks very much for your presentation. And really thank you everyone for all of your hard work. It's exciting that we'll have kids um, back in school. Um, I just have a couple of things. You, uh, Dr. Noonan, you, you you froze on my screen when you were talking, when you were going through the side-by-side -side chart. Um, on the virtual column, it says Tuesday through Friday, two one-half day virtual lessons. Um, but um, in the typical day, it seems like the, the students who are virtual will have a half day every day Monday, uh, sorry, every day Tuesday through Friday. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a bit of a nomenclature issue. I think that um, a couple of folks have sort of, um, we need to maybe be more clear about it. The two half days are really the morning and the afternoon session. So students will get a half day morning either with their con mm -hmm. content teacher or with their encore teacher. And then in the afternoon, they'll flip and they'll get a half day either with their core teacher or their encore teacher. So it, it looks like you're just getting half days, but you're actually getting a full day. So okay. two half days back to back. Thank you. And then um, do we have enough cameras? Do we need more cameras? Are they like other things and they've all been, you know, everyone's ordered them and they're all gone. Yeah, it's like buying mums. Everybody's planted them at this point. You can't find them anywhere. Um, yes, we, uh, 
we are very fortunate to have received from um, the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, some additional CARES funding uh, recently. And so we are able, to, and, and I wanna thank Kristen and Dang and the technology team because they were able to put the AVER camera people on alert that we might be getting some extra funding. And we found out that they had the necessary number in their warehouse if we had just if we just issued the PO by last Friday. <laughs> Sounds like a hard sell. Um, but we we were able to issue the PO by last Friday. So we will have enough of the AVER cameras um, at the elementary to flip back and forth. And the other big news around um, the AVER cameras, and I, I cautiously tell you this because I don't want to get into the secondary conversation until maybe at the end or after the end, um, but we will be able to outfit the classrooms at the high school and the middle school with the AVER cameras as well. And we're really excited about that. In fact, we are looking at doing a slight change order at the high school to be able to mount those AVER cameras in the ceiling. So regardless of when they're used, um, and it would allow us a lot of opportunities to invite kids in to take some of our classes remotely and, and the like. We're excited about that. So long, long answer to your short question. The answer is yes. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Um, Ms. Litton, I see you have your hand up and I'm gonna keep looking for others as well. Thank you, Dr. Noonan, and thanks for everybody's work on this. Um, it seems like a great plan. I just have a couple kind of clarifying questions. Um, for, the, for the virtual students, if I understood it correctly, whether you have kind of your core in the morning or afternoon is not necessarily by your last name, but sort of however you guys end up doing um, maybe one grade this virtual core curriculum in the morning and another one in the afternoon based on camera usage. Is that correct? Yes, that is a, a good observation. Um, the, the virtual students won't be broken by alphabet. Um, they will be broken by um, how we can m maneuver the cameras back and forth. So, so it could be by grade level there. So, so I don't know, Tim and Paul, do, do one of you want to sort of talk about how you're splitting the camera? Is that too much detail, Ms. Litton? Because I don't want to necessarily um, go into too much detail. Either way is fine. I was just thinking more for parents who ask us if you're virtual, okay. kind of hold on and you'll get an answer in a while, whether you're morning or afternoon core. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. So maybe okay. that's enough information. For me. yep. <laughs> um, then I had another question, just kind of curious with buses at lunchtime, will they go around and drop off some kids and at the same time pick up other ones or will they have time to do like a round of drop off and then go back and do a round of pickup or how, how are they going to do that? I believe it's the latter, but I'll let Miss Michael answer that question. Yes, it is a ladder. They're going to take um, all of the elementary students home first, and then they'll pick up the PM students. And again, this is really part of our minimizing the number of contacts. So we don't want to mix the morning and afternoon students on the bus at the same time. And it gives us a Got chance it. to wipe, wipe down the buses and do a little okay. cleaning. Okay. And then my final question is just sort of a kind of how we feel. How do we feel about parents using kind of the virtual piece if you're signed up for hybrid and then kind of using the virtual piece just sort of as they want say the week of Thanksgiving they decided they wanted to go out of town I mean are students free to say oh Monday Tuesday I'm not going to be in class and I'm going to join the virtual or kind of how are we going to handle that or I don't know if we've really dealt with it. You know, kind you of know this that's an interesting, it's an interesting question. And it's one that at least uh, our team hasn't contemplated. Um, you know, obviously we're planning for kids to come back. We're setting up classrooms um, and, and we're hoping that kids will come back. I, I suppose we could be flexible, but I'd like to talk with the principals and, and some of our teachers first before I say hard and fast that, that we want to be flexible, but I, I think I think the, the the sort of at the base level, sort of what this plan does is creates a ton of flexibility for just those purposes. So I, I think I think in the end we'll probably say yeah we'll be flexible, but um, we also want to give. I, I'd like to hear from our principals before I give a up or down. That's okay. Sure, thank you. That's all I have, Chair Anderson. 
Thank you, Ms. Litton. Um, I saw Mr. Reitinger had a hand up. I see Ms. Russell, Vice Chair Russell has a hand up. And then, uh, so uh, Mr. Reitinger, you're up. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think all the questions that I was going to ask have been already asked by Dr. Demick and Ms. Litton. So I will hold on those and just ask for coming up with this proposal. As you've heard from me before, the things I was most concerned were flexibility and, uh, and simplicity. And this plan, I think, meets those requirements very well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Uh, Vice Chair Russell? Um, yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, uh, get some additional clarification with regard to the Mondays. Um, and I guess, first of all, um, my understanding overall is that they're planned as teacher work time um, and planning time. Um, but it looks like at the same time, there's the morning meeting that the teachers will be still having with the kids. Um, and then obviously some of the teachers will be engaged later with regard to enrichment or remedial. Um, so I guess I'm just kind of curious how that is gonna be balanced and what the expectations are for teachers in terms of Mondays. Sure. Um, Tim, I hate to put you on the spot. You wanna take that one? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so those are really good questions. And uh, some of them we're still trying to kind of work out the logistics. Finding that right balance um, of intervention and enrichment on those days um, is kind of going to be dependent on a case by case basis. Um, in other words, we don't want to overwhelm any one child or one family with specific requirements to be online uh, more than their their um, peers. Um, but what's really most important to us on those days is um, that the the classroom teachers connect with their students through their morning meeting. Um, that'll be, you know, the one piece that is required of everybody, that social and emotional piece that Dr. Noonan mentioned earlier. We've been really focused on that this year and trying to build that classroom community virtually. So maintaining that on Mondays is really important to us. Um, I'll be working with my, my specialists, uh, ESOL staff, special education teachers, and, and some interventionists to help, you know, determine uh, the best course of action for children who need those additional accommodations or services um, in moving forward. Uh, but again, one of the things we want to make sure that we're very careful of is um, monitoring the amount of screen time um, that our children are required for each day. So we'll be we'll be looking at a lot of different variables and factors as we as we plan and 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 see what needs we have to meet. Okay, thanks, Mr. Kasich. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to add on, I think one of the things that you'll note um, in slide 12 is when, when we talk about the specialists, the ESOL specialists, um, special ed gifted services, those, those folks that are providing the intervention typically aren't the grade level team te teachers. Um, and so because they're not the grade level team teachers, they can dovetail in at different points at the team meetings. So that planning time um, that is really being afforded on those Mondays is a lot for the grade level team teams. Okay. Yeah. I just want, again, I just wanted to make sure that the teachers are getting the planning time that they need um, because obviously this is a pretty big lift in terms of coordinating um, the virtual and the in-person um, and the split schedule. And I, I think that as Mr. Reitinger said, the plan itself is um, the simplicity is beautiful. And so I think it's really straightforward and easy to understand but there are still a lot of meeting, moving parts. And I just wanna make sure that the teachers are getting the time that they need um, to make sure that they can pull it all off. Um, and I guess along those same lines, the second question I had was looking at the one hour that they have in between the two, the morning and the afternoon kids um, and fitting lunch and cleaning in there. So I don't know if this is gonna be something that Ms. Michaels is gonna go into a little bit more, but trying to understand how the claim is gonna work, who's responsible for it, and I guess how it's gonna be accomplished and have lunch all within that one hour period. Sure. Um, Kristen, Ms. Michael, do you wanna address that now? Yes. Sure. Okay. So when we look at the lunch that we're gonna to serve to students, the morning students on the way out the door, so as they're leaving, they'll pick up their lunch and take it with them. Um, they won't be able to eat it on the bus. We'll want them to wait and eat that lunch when they get home. And then the kids that are coming in for the afternoon um, who want to pick up lunch will pick up their lunch on the way in. 
Um, so we won't be eating in the cafeteria or using that congregate space. The students that eat at school um, will be eating elsewhere, potentially in their classroom okay, or spaces. All right, I'm sorry, I should have clarified. I meant for the teachers. For, oh, the, for teachers the teachers to have time to eat. <laughs> yeah, oh, I understand with the students. I meant about the teachers to have time to eat and still get the cleaning done. Yes, so as soon as the kids are dismissed, the morning class is dismissed. Um, in each classroom, our facilities team has put bottles of disinfectant spray and microfiber towels. So they'll be able to spray down each of the desks, um, wipe them clean, and then they'll have um, plenty of time to have their duty-free lunch. Throughout the day, we're gonna have the day custodian doing all of the high touch areas, cleaning all of the restrooms multiple times and doing those components. But we will ask for support from the staff in the school, teachers and paras, in terms of wiping the student desk down in between the two groups of students. Okay, great, thanks. thanks. Ms. Michael, thanks. Sorry, looking for other hands up. Um, and Mr. Webb, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. Just real quick, that just to, to thank um, Becky and me and the team for putting together a, a pretty thorough plan. Um, it's, it hits a lot of the areas that I think I had questions and questions, clarifying questions were already asked that I had, but um, just wanted to, to thank you all because I, I get it. It's, it's a lot of moving parts that it will continue to be moving, not only right now, but at all times so, and so I understand that you all will continue to to fine tune and and make these plans better but I do think the hard work that you all have done now and and starting to get our students back into the classroom and look forward to the rest of the presentation thank you very much all right are there uh, other questions on this section and Ms. Downs has her hands up. I'm just scrolling up sorry for the delay Ms. Downs please go ahead Thank you, Jay Anderson. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. A uh, quick question and quick comment. Um, the comment is, I like, uh, I really do like having the Monday um, for some intervention services. Our fifth grader has a brief, um, has an IEP for speech and has, so has a brief meeting with his speech teacher each week. And it's been hard for him to remember to exit out of learning with his classroom teacher. And so we moved it to the morning before school, but I just, I think that is a nice, um, option to have on the Monday for our specialists. And uh, the question is, um, have we, have the teachers been able to, I, I think I remember reading about this, but have the teachers been able to undergo some training on how to use the streaming and teaching in the classroom and streaming at the same time? Thank you. Sure. Uh, Mr. Bates, do you want to address that one? Yeah, thank you. Um, and that's, that's a good question. So the those online or live streaming cameras that's something that we've been talking about for a long time and, and kind of pushing in on and so um with the support of dang um nguyen who is our um, tech director as well as mr steve knight they have offered up um, a number of presentations um and they're also offering up personal presentations um prior to setting up the cameras in, in teachers classrooms as well Thank you, and thanks to, to your staff and, and the teachers. I know this is a big undertaking. We really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, I am looking for any final comments um, on this first section. Not seeing any more right now. I will just say um, <laughs> I'm fortunate in that all of the questions I would have asked in this section have also been asked. Uh, so I can just say thank you and, and uh, We'll continue on to the next section. The, the next couple of sections are, um, they're, they're fairly text rich and, and this sort of thing, but it's a lot from the, from the documents. So I think we're, uh, we're looking forward to hearing the rest. So thanks. I'll be able to move through this section pretty quickly um, because it's, it, has, it is um, sort of information that we've been over and I don't wanna tread over too much, but I wanted to start just by um, talking about special education. Um, and I wanna thank very particularly um, Rebecca Sharp and Seamus O'Connor for their work around special education services and working with our families. Um, they've done an extraordinary job reaching out personally, but those students, whether they're in the hybrid model or whether they're in the online model, um, they will still have access to um, their IEP and it will be implemented. Um, we will continue to work with case managers 
um, or the case managers will continue to work with families to ensure that continuity of learning. Um, and then as necessary, if there are issues that arise, uh, as always, parents can call for an IEP or um, teachers can call for an IEP. But um, we, we just want to make sure everybody understands that we will work uh, diligently to implement uh, special education services. Um, the second is around um, students with 504 plans. Um, we have a number of students with 504s across our system, and these plans are typically um, handled through um, our school counselors. So I want to um, thank our, our school counselors, and particularly Tara Filmeyer, who's over at Henderson, who is our lead um, counselor across the division for helping. Um, but students that do have 504s will continue to have access to their accommodations, whether they're in the hybrid or if they're in face to, in the face-to-face, -face or the, I'm sorry, hybrid face-to-face -face or online. Um, and the 504 case managers will continue to work with our families and ensure students that are, are supported fully. Um, looking at the next round is ESOL. Um, and, and I also wanna thank Lori Prather at Thomas Jefferson also uh, for her incredible work as a school counselor with some of these 504s as well. So ESOL, um, English learners um, will, uh, whether they participate in the hybrid or in um, the online will continue to re receive their ESOL services and those will be embedded throughout both um, programs. So right now, just as an example, um, at, uh, at Henderson today, we provided essentially what would be a co-taught hybrid model. So our students with ESOL, um, many of our students with ESOL, not all, were at Henderson. They had their laptops there, they had their earbuds in or whatever their um, source of sound was and they were working with their ESOL teacher and their general education teacher online. So if they stay online, they will continue to receive online services. Um, and, and if they're face-to-face, -face, obviously they will get the face-to-face -face support as well. Um, with respect to gifted and talented services, we want to assure our, our gifted and talented parents that we will continue to um, engage your students through um, some uh, quality instruction that provides in, uh, depth and complexity necessary to meet the, the requirements of our gifted and talented students, whether they're in the hybrid model or in face-to-face. -face. And our GT teachers across the system will continue to um, support and reach out to the families as we, as we move forward. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about breakfast and lunch. Um, this was touched on a little bit earlier um, by Kristen, but just to make sure that um, everybody understands the details of this, um, our students that are in the AM session will have access to breakfast. Um, and then any student who would like will also have access to lunch. Um, and that breakfast is also at no cost. Um, when students come in to get their breakfast, they'll take their breakfast to their classrooms and they will eat from a socially distanced uh, place uh, in the classroom. And then they'll pick up their lunch as they leave or pick it up when they come in, as we mentioned earlier, and eat that bag lunch in the classroom. We are encouraging students who aren't, um, aren't eating at school to please eat before they come to school if they're in the afternoon session. Um, that would be um, helpful to us, but not mandatory. So we will have lunch, um, but we are encouraging that. Um, students that do eat at school will do that in a socially distanced way. We'll also have opportunities to be outside if weather permits. Um, a couple of things about food I wanna make sure are super clear to the board and to the community. And that is that there won't be any food sharing allowed and that we will not permit any outside food. So um, for the time being, we are suspending any uh, practice that has been in place for birthday celebrations and the like. Um, we are not gonna allow any outside food to come into the school. Additionally, um, we aren't gonna provide any of our instructional activities that involve food either. So you may, may have had a class where you were looking at ratio and proportion or thinking about um, you know, quarter cups, half cups. And one of the ways that you were doing that was you were making some sort of soup or you were making some sort of dish. Uh, we are not gonna do any kind of food related activities. Um, and then any family um, with a virtual model student can continue to participate in our food pickup services. We still offer food pickup for our families that are um, in need and we'll continue to provide food for our, our students that are meeting face to face for the weekend as well. Um, recess and outdoor learning opportunities. We learned from the Fairfax County Health Department and others that the outdoors is a really great place to be. Um, it's probably as safe as a place that you can be. So we are really gonna try to provide for as many opportunities as possible for our students to go outside, um, weather permitting. Outdoor areas um, are gonna also be used for learning spaces. We have purchased some portable canopies 
that can go up and can help facilitate that process as necessary. Um, and so we would ask our families to please monitor the weather um, and ensure that your student is coming with, an, with a jacket, for example, if it's gonna be a little bit chilly outside that particular day. Um, transportation to and from school. Um, we do have a number of our students uh, that are gonna be limited in, in the space that we have on buses. So we have expanded those walk zones. We did include those maps in um, the information that went to families and we will continue to reach out to the families that are part of the, walk, the new walk zone. Um, and if you reside in one of those expanded walk zones, transportation at this point will not be available to you. So we are asking that you be able to uh, bring your, your child to school. Um, and in that same vein, we are uh, working on all of our kiss and ride um, options at both Mount Daniel and at Thomas Jefferson to see if there's any more signage that needs to be done, any more painting that needs to be done, crosswalks, et cetera. Um, Wyatt Shields um, has been very helpful in offering up an opportunity to get together to talk with Public Works about how we may be able, may be able to um, support those kiss and ride zones as well. Um, if you reside outside of the walk zone, but you don't need transportation, the reason that we're asking you uh, for that information is because if you do give up your space and you can get transportation in a different way, we may be able to um, modify those walk zones slightly and provide some opportunities for folks that live in the walk zones. Uh, and then with respect to the extended daycare program, I won't linger in all of the details, um, but I will tell the board and the community that there is a, a survey that either went out today or will go out tomorrow, um, asking our families that are currently in daycare um, if we open daycare from eight to four and you were able to come in the morning or the afternoon, would that serve your needs better perhaps than the current way that we are looking at providing daycare? Um, and so we're looking for some good information back on that from our folks that are participating in daycare. And we think that we can meet the needs of our community a little bit better by doing that. Um, there currently is a wait list uh, for our daycare, but families, um, uh, you know, you know, can certainly sign up and, and we'll accommodate you as we can. Um, we do continue to monitor space and staffing for our extended daycare and Parks and Rec is also on continuing to maintain their programs and has been a great partner with us as well. Um, but any questions of, about daycare would go to Katie Clinton. And lastly, um, just about water fountains and bottle fillers um, and then building cleaning protocols. And uh, I wanna, Again, thank Kristen and her team um, and Sevi, and I, I failed to mention thanking Richard Kane and Nancy Hendrickson for their incredible work in food services also and uh, transportation. But the water fountains and bottle fillers based on CDC guidance um, are gonna be modified to the extent that the water fountains are going to be closed, uh, but the bottle fillers will be open. So we are gonna encourage students to bring their own personal water bottle from home um, if a student isn't able to purchase or have a water bottle, um, we are looking at getting some donated so we can provide some water bottles for students and then students can just continually refill their water bottles. And that's much safer than drinking out of a water fountain at the moment. Um, and then with respect to cleaning, um, we will continue to do the deep cleanings and sanitizing every single night. Um, high touch areas, as Ms. Michael indicated earlier, are gonna be cleaned multiple times throughout the day by the staff the custodial staff that's on site. <clears throat> and just as an example of that, um, you may recall from a prior conversation, we don't have a full-time custodian at Jesse Thackeray, but we re have repurposed um, someone from um, our custodial crew to be down at Jesse Thackeray full-time during the day when um, kids are there to continue to walk, work through those high-touch areas. Uh, classrooms and other areas are gonna be cleaned between the AM and PM groups. And then shared materials will be cleaned at night as well with sprayers. So there are some larger manipulatives and the like that um, we will uh, be cleaning using the sanitary sprayers and the, um, and the misting machines and the like. So that takes us to our next break. Um, that was a pretty high level overview of most of the things that uh, may be on the minds of people. And then we'll get into um, some of the what if um, scenarios in the health and safety protocols. So, uh, Mr. Anderson, Chair Anderson, Dr. Anderson, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Uh, any of those works, of course. Um, we're, <laughs> we're flexible here. Um, all right, I'm looking for questions at this point. Um, I have a few of my own, but we'll see if they get asked first. Um, I see Ms. Lytton and uh, Dr. Demick and Ms. Downs.
Sorry, you want me to go ahead, Greg? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Um, my first, thanks, Dr. Noonan. My first question is just about the providing the food. I'm just kind of curious, um, since it sounds like it could be available to anybody, how we're going to kind of control numbers and is that going to be a significant cost um, for the upcoming year? So I, I'll, I'll start and then I'll let um, Ms. Michael sort of follow up. But um, in terms of controlling numbers, the, one of the questions on the return or intent to return form is, will you need a lunch? Um, so we should have a pretty good sense um, sort of more immediately about how many students need it. Um, and then with respect to cost controls and the like, um, Ms. Michael, do you want to take that one? Yes, thank you. The um, federal government reapproved the pandemic feeding program. So we're able to receive reimbursement from the federal school lunch program for all students who receive meals. So families currently don't have to apply for or qualify for free and reduced price meals. So that is a, a true benefit um, to us in terms of revenue, but, but more importantly to our students. So we really do want to encourage families to take advantage of our food program. We will ensure that as we're feeding kids at school, when we're giving families food boxes on Fridays, that we're not duplicating or, or double counting any meals. So we will adjust the food that's picked up each week by what gets handed out at school. Um, but this is a true benefit to our families. So we really do encourage people who need that to take advantage. Um, we know that additional federal revenue will help us, um, our, our cost for food service, um, most significantly are our staff members who are committed um, and they've been working crazy hard. I'm really doing a ton of meals. Um, and then our other cost is food costs. So being able to plan and do food each week and knowing who needs breakfast or lunch will really help us in that area as well. Ms. Michael, it's my understanding that that food, that reimbursement program is temporary, um, that it will expire in roughly January. So that's what we're hearing, but there is um, advocacy underfoot to expand it to the end of the school year. So right now we're working um, with it going through the month of December, but we are hopeful that it could be extended till June. Great, thank you. That's good news. Um, I just had one other question about daycare. I'm assuming we're still providing some daycare for staff um, and just kind of curious space-wise, since usually daycare is after school and before school, and now it's during school, plus those um, children sort of where, where we're putting them and how, that, how the space issue is working. Yes, so Katie Clinton has been really thoughtful in terms of how we're serving students and how we're not mixing them together. And then I have to give a huge shout out to Tim Kasich and Paul Salance and our two principals who've also been tremendously accommodating in, in terms of working with us to ensure that we can seamlessly do this. So our current plan is we've been doing supervised learning for our school age children of our staff and those students will be in the library. So they won't be mixing with the students that are attending our daycare program before or after school. In those cases, we'll use cafeteria space. And again, we keep all of those kids physically distanced um, and then we won't mix those two groups together. I want to, I just want to add um, one thing to consider is that we, we would anticipate um, that some of the numbers might go up in the supervised learning as we return to school and we're ready for that. Um, but the other thing to consider is that some of the surrounding jurisdictions are starting to make plans for returning some of their learners as well. Um, so as um, other school divisions begin to open, our numbers of supervised learning students will decrease because we are housing, um, housing is not the right word. We are supervising the learning of um, a significant number of students from Fairfax County and Loudoun County. Great, thank you so much. That's all I had, Chair Anderson, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then I have Dr. Dimmick and Ms. Downs in that order and I will keep looking for other hands. Thanks very much. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is just um, in regard to eating in the classroom. Um, has thought been given to another location to eat that could be more socially distanced when the kids have their mask off eating? Um, or is it definitely gonna be the classroom if you can't go outside? Um, yeah, that's my first question. You want the second one? Okay, I, the second one was Carmageddon. 
Um, I think it's great sorry. that we're talking about, you I know, was muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that I'm we're, sorry. Uh, that we're talking about, you know, signage for kiss and ride, but what if everyone drives um, and all goes to the same spot? Have we, do we have any idea of how bad it might be? Yeah, so let, let me take both of those questions. Um, actually, Kristen, why don't you take the first one? I'll take the second one. Why don't you take the one about food and I'll take the one about kiss and ride. Sure, so as we're thinking about where students eat, right, the health department has been really clear with us about the important thing is ensuring that we have six feet of space. And as we're looking at kids coming back in a hybrid model, we're very fortunate in that our class sizes are small. So when we first start with half of those kids, and then when we look at some percentage of students um, being in an all virtual model, I really do believe that we'll have space inside the classroom if we need to have um, lunch there to ensure that we really do have adequate space around students who have their masks off during, during eating. Um, we've been serving lunch in our supervised learning program for all the children of our staff. Um, the whole school year and it's really working quite well. Students are, are very responsible in terms of staying in their place and eating in the classroom. We're also very fortunate at our schools that we have great outdoor space. Um, so we know that that's something else that can be used, but, but I really do believe that we have adequate space in the classrooms if needed. And then with respect to your second question, um, sort of the easier, the easier one is I'll start at Thomas Jefferson. And I know, I know that Principal Swanson has been talking about looking at both sides of uh, TJ as potential kiss and ride options. Um, so looking at not only the Oak Street side, but um, the Seton and, and George Basin Drive side as well as places for um, potentially kiss and ride. The more challenging is gonna be at Mount Daniel. And I know that Mr. Kasich has been um, working with Kristen and transportation to, si to see if there were some other ways that we could work that through. Um, I've been meeting, I have a meeting coming up with um, with Wyatt Shields, we've talked about the possibility of maybe doing a temporary kiss and ride on Highland if we could approach the community in the right way. Um, but we're not we're not um, we're not suggesting that. So if anybody from Highland is is looking at this video, we we would want to have a conversation before we did that. Um, but we are looking at trying to utilize uh, as much of the parking lot at. Mount Daniel as possible as well. So there's a rather large parking lot to be able to queue and come up and around as well. So I think um, when we when we actually do the math and we look at the fact that we may not have say 20% of our kids, we're only gonna serve 80% of the kids face to face and we're only gonna serve half of that 80% at a time. We're down to 40% of the kids. So that's about 180 kids roughly. Um, that we would see each day face to face. We already know based on some of the data that we're getting that there are a significant number of folks that are gonna ride the bus, maybe 80, maybe, maybe 90. So that puts us down to 90 kids that would ride. So we are monitoring it very closely um, to see how we may be, may be able to work that through. But um, I, I, I do have concerns at Mount Daniel about traffic Mageddon, um, but hopefully we can, we can work some systems out that will be helpful. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Um, and I have, uh, I saw Ms. Downs had her hand up and I'm looking for others as well. So, Ms. Downs. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Uh, thank you, Dr. Noon. I actually uh, was, that was going to be my question was the knowing. Um, you know, historically how we're trying to limit uh, traffic on Oak Street, how we were going to handle uh, Mount Daniel. I think, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you all don't already know, but I think once we have a plan in place to just make sure we communicate it with the neighbors, and even if it's not ideal, letting them know this is temporary, we're in the middle of a pandemic, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll understand. Um, but I think, you know, communication is key with that. Thank you. Thank you. The one thing I didn't mention in, in the answer that we could also explore, and we're still talking about it a little bit, is um, walk, walking buses, they're called. So essentially, you have some kids that are socially distanced that sort of walk together, um, in, not, in, not in tight groups, but in larger groups that could be led by a parent or, or another person. Um, so one of the options might be to do a walking bus at Mount Daniel. It might be able to do a walking bus at TJ. But we will definitely communicate out um, where traffic is going to flow. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Are there any other questions at this point? OK, 
keep looking to the side at my list of questions and discovering that people are asking them first. So um, we're all thinking in uh, similar ways somewhere. Um, I think if there aren't any questions that anybody else would like to ask, I would like to ask one, um, one question and, and it may be that this comes later, but I'll just ask, um, do we have sufficient staff? And we talked about students arriving you know, and dealing with the traffic situation there, but do we have the staff and the, the capability and the flow plans worked out for how we're going to be able to bring all of the students in and their cohorts in a timely fashion, socially distanced, separated, and, and get them into the classrooms and, and onto the buses and, and do that at the beginning and at lunchtime and at the end. And I know, I, thank you for that question. I know that, that Tim and Paul are working hard on those plans right now. Um, one of the things that I just want to um, sort of uh, remind the board and remind the community is that when, when you're masked, passing each other is not a contact. Um, so, so while we, we want to do the best we can to maintain social distancing when we're bringing kids in, if kids do get inside six feet, that's not considered a contact if it's a very brief amount of time. Um, based on my observation today um, and the number of adults that were available just to bring in the 30 kids or so at um, Jesse Thackeray, I, I have full confidence that uh, Tim and Paul and their teams will be able to um, sort of source up the necessary human resources to be able to bring kids in and, and do that, that kind of work. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I understand the, the time factor in terms of if you're not close, if everyone's masked and you're not close together for, for more than a few seconds walking by, then it's, it's a, you know, sort of passing, it's as if you were walking down the uh, aisle of a grocery store in town or something along those lines too. But um, just wanna make sure I'm thinking about when, when folks come together to get on and off the buses is really sort of where I was, I was thinking about. The other question I suppose along these same lines is, um, and, and it was asked before um, in a different form, but I'll just, I'll ask again, I'm thinking about the, um, the time for the teachers to eat their lunches in the middle of that gap when there's people moving in and out. And do we have the space um, for them to be able to do that? Is it, are they, will they be eating lunches in their classrooms or will they have a chance to go somewhere else and, and sort of catch a break, I suppose is really kind of where I'm going. So, so so we're, we're very confident that they'll be able to do a, a, a cleanup in their classroom in probably less than 15 minutes. Um, Sevi has done a great job of providing all of the necessary materials, the spray bottles, the, the chamois cloths, everything that needs to be there, um, which would then give the teachers 45 minutes of roughly 45 minutes of time. Um, they certainly can eat wherever they want. They can eat in their classroom. They can eat outside if they wanted to. Um, you know, sit in their car and eat, they can do that. If they want to sit socially distanced in the cafeteria, they could do that. Um, but they'll certainly have those options as adults um, to, to go where they, where they want for their lunch. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking about the spacing and just trying to, trying to make sure because that's, it's, um, you know, we want to make sure everybody has enough time to, to eat and have enough time to take a break in the middle of the day. So, okay. Um, are there any other questions on this section uh, at this point? I'm gonna scroll up and down. I'm not seeing any, I will say, Dr. Noonan, why don't we go ahead and continue onward, please? Thanks. All right, so I'm gonna turn the last section over to um, Rebecca Sharp. Um, and she has, uh, of course, been the empress of COVID. Um, but before we go there, all of those sort of operational and instructional components that I spoke of earlier, um, I do wanna give, um, a, a real shout out to um, William Bates, our chief academic officer for working with um, all of our instructional folks to kind of pull all of this together. And then Kristen Michael as well, chief operating officer for pulling all the operational pieces together. It's been um, a, a pretty big, pretty big move. And they've, they've done extraordinary work um, along with Rebecca Sharp. So um, Ms. Sharp, I will turn it over to you for this, this section. All right, so I'm going to cover the, I'm going to bring it home for us, and I'm going to cover the um, health and safety protocols that we have in place for returning students. These are some really critical things that we've identified that in structures that have been put in place, and I want to also thank Tim and Paul and Amanda and Jeremy for all of their great questions, great 
um, thoughts and feedback and the procedures that they have put in place in schools. And today we really was our first run of it and it really went seamlessly. And um, kudos to Marie for um, the things that were done. So all of these pieces that I'm about to present, we actually have been implementing at um, Henderson, JTP, Mount Daniel and TJ. So I'm really excited about this. The first piece that we wanted to um, talk about when we talk about bringing students back is that all of our students in order to return for in-person learning must have all their immunizations and physicals completed before they can return in the hybrid model. And all of our registrars and our principals have been working with families to make sure that those get completed. And so it's really important for parents to understand that if you have not completed your immunizations or your physical, you're not, your student's not going to be able to um, attend in person. The other um, piece that um, we're continuing to work with the health department on is to encourage everyone to get flu shots. We are in a pandemic and we don't want to layer on a bigger influenza outbreak on top of what we're already, already dealing with with COVID. And influenza is something that we can reduce significantly by all getting the flu shot. So those are, those are um, two, our first two important health pieces. And then our next critical piece is that we're asking all staff and families to do a daily health screening. And so it's really having that conversation um, before your child leaves home, before any staff member leaves their house to get in their car to come to work, they want we want them to ask um, the questions that are listed on here. We want them to look at their symptoms and to answer yes or no to those each and every morning before you come to our buildings. And the biggest piece is, do you have a new fever? or a new cough, or are you experiencing shortness of breath or any chills or a sore throat or um, muscle aches. And that you and the critical pieces here is that you can't attribute to another condition. We know we, know we have students who have asthma and that can cause their shortness of breath. So that can be attributed to an, another condition. So that wouldn't meet the criteria for, you know, a red flag for concern for your health. But the, um, this is going to be a really important piece. And we're asking our families to partner with us. And we ask our staff to ask the same questions before they leave the house every day. And the big piece is if students or staff are not feeling well or answer yes to those questions, we need for them to remain home. This is really important, particularly when we're talking about the COVID symptoms. When we're talking about COVID-like illness, when you're experiencing those symptoms, in order to return, staff and students will need to provide a clearance from their healthcare provider or a negative COVID test in order to return to our buildings. And that's in alignment with the CDC regulations uh, or CDC guidance, as well as the procedures and protocols that we've put in place with the Fairfax County Health Department. The, some of the other pieces to keeping everyone safe is, is how we're handling when there is a COVID exposure. So and some of the other questions that you need, that families and staff need to ask themselves before they come to work is, have they had any contact with anyone that um, has tested positive for COVID-19 or is experiencing COVID-like symptoms? Or have the in contact, when you're thinking about have you had direct contact with someone, that goes back to that definition of being within six feet or closer for more than 15 minutes or having direct contact with um, fluids from a person that is COVID-19 positive. For example, being coughed on or sneezed on. The other piece is have you had a COVID-19 test with an active virus um, positive result in the past 10 days? So if, you know, if you've been in contact with someone or you yourself have tested positive, you need to stay home and that, um, within the past 14 days has a public health or medical professional told you that you need to self-monitor or self-isolate because of concerns about COVID. So folks need to stay home if, when we're in those situations. And it's really important that we're all adhering to these health guidelines and staying home if we are ill 
if we've been around others who are ill, if we live with someone who is ill, or we've been in situations where we may have been exposed to um, COVID-19 by someone who has tested positive. And so if you're answering yes to any of those screening questions, we need for folks to stay home, that's students and staff, because the, we have to maintain a um, safe environment and you can't do that with sick with sick people in your building. So it's really important that folks stay home. And all parents um, must contact the school if anyone in their house is sick with COVID like illness, anyone in their house is tested positive for COVID-19, anyone is being tested for COVID-19, or they have a COVID positive person in their household, or they have some other known exposure and they've been asked um, to quarantine. All the information that we receive is going to be treated in a very secure and confidential manner. But these are critical pieces of information that as a school division, we need to know. One of the other pieces, um, as far as our health and safety protocols that we have in place are temperature checks. Every student will have their temperature checked before they enter a school building. So our transportation staff have all done an excellent job of going through training on how to use the thermometers. And so um, all, the all the transportation staff will check temperatures before kids get on the bus. And then each of the schools have great processes in place for checking car riders, walkers, any late students that come in, and any visitors that come into our buildings. We are limiting visitors, but if a visitor has to come in, their temperatures will be checked as well. So that's, those are part of those great processes that um, Tim and Jeremy and Paul and Amanda have put in place for their schools as we reopen. Um, each school has been provided with multiple touchless digital thermometers, thanks to SEVI for securing all those for us. And any student or staff with a temperature of 100.4 or greater should not enter a building or a bus. And any staff member that's conducting um, temperature checks, we want to make sure that they're safe as well. So we um, have asked that they wear a face covering or mask, a face shield, as well as gloves, so that we make sure we keep everybody safe in the process. And then this is a, um, some guidance regarding wearing face coverings and masks. We are expecting all staff and students to wear face cloth. Uh, face coverings when they're interacting with each other in the building. We've got extra face coverings available at all the schools for anybody who needs one or forgets that the, or forgets theirs. Um, face coverings are appropriate for routine school activities and should be worn at all times by staff, students, and any visitors that come in. And we do recognize the need for support for those. We have, you know, we have young children and we have kids with developmental issues and medical conditions and disabilities. And we're, you know, we're being patient. Kids have to develop mass stamina. And I will say, I went to all four schools today and across four schools, I only saw two students who had their masks down and the kids were very conscientious of it the staff was very conscientious about it there were you know and you know and kids when they slipped down kids were pulling them back up and so we want you know we want to support our students and um if you watch the video um that that the presentation that the health department did with the, did for our school division last week. One of the really interesting things is they monitored student mask wearing at um, different points in the day, counting and across um, their studies that they they saw eighty to ninety percent compliance with mask wearing among students. And so I think that's you know and I, you know and I've just anecdotally what I saw today was extremely impressive from all of our kids and from you know even from our youngest learners. And then we are, we do have face shields that are available and those offer an additional layer of protection. We do have some young, very, very young students and we, and, and some of our students with disabilities who struggle, who may have sensory issues, who struggle with a mask right up against their 
their face. So providing that face shield um, is an option that we're utilizing for them. And um, for staff, we have face shields available for all of our staff members. And it is critical, especially for adults when you're wearing face shields, that one, they're worn in conjunction with a mask or a face covering. They're not designed to be worn alone by adults and that all face shields should be cleaned properly every single day. And so we've provided training on that. Hand hygiene, the gold standard for disease prevention anywhere is washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. And so we are really encouraging that all of our students and staff should wash their hands when they get to school, before and after eating, before and after using the bathroom, and before and after using re, uh, going to recess at a very minimum. And then when hand washing isn't available, we've got hand sanitizing stations strategically located uh, around each of the schools. Sevy's done a, and his team have done a great job of making sure those are in place. Additionally, we've provided um, the larger bottles of hand sanitizers. In fact, I was at Mount Daniel and they had a great hand sanitizing station right when you come in off of the kindergarten playground. There was a great big gallon jug of hand sanitizer sitting on the table and everybody grabbed some right as they were coming in the door. It was a beautiful thing to see. So we've got hand sanitizing stations um, in place when hand washing is not available. The other big health and safety piece is social distancing, that everybody needs to observe social distancing guidelines and staff and students should remain six feet apart as possible. Passing someone is not a high risk activity. Remaining near someone for greater than 15 minutes is, that creates a potential exposure, whether you're masked or unmasked. And one of the wonderful things that has also been done across all the schools is visual supports have been placed in all the schools to help support social distancing. You know, at Mount Daniel and at TJ, they had visual markers on the floors and they had the same thing in place at Henderson as well as at JT. And so it's really important that we reinforce that social distancing. So it was nice to see all those visual supports there for our, our young learners as they came back today. And social distancing applies to all of us everywhere. It is especially important when we're out in the community, wherever we are, that we're following social distancing guidelines because, you know, it, it's great we're doing all the social distancing in school, but if we're not doing it at home, you know, and we're not doing it at the grocery store and we're not doing it, you know, if we're going out for a walk or, you know, we're, you know, you know, seeing our neighbors as we wave to them, if we're not following those rules, then that again increases the likelihood of the spread of the virus. All right, any questions? Mr. Anderson, I, I'm, I wonder if um, the last section, this is a lot of what we just shared, I think is known pretty broadly, um, but the next section gets into some of the scenarios and I wonder if maybe it would make sense for us just to plow forward, unless there are some um, real burning questions, maybe plow forward with the last section and then take the questions at the end, but I'll leave that to you to determine. Thank you, Dr. Newton. I actually think that makes sense, given especially that the next part really is um, how are we going to deal with things if the you know if if people are sick in the schools or or get sick when they come and this sort of thing. I think it just builds on that. Why don't we go ahead and do that? I'm looking for anybody who strenuously is objecting, not seeing any. Let's go ahead. All right, so since we are reopening school in a pandemic, we've worked very closely with the health department. Our school health aides and our public health nurses are all assigned to our schools. Our health clinics are open and they are fully staffed and they are fully stocked with supplies. And if it's just someone gets sick at school, if a student gets sick at school, the first thing that will happen is they will go to the health room. Students will not enter the health room. We've placed visual signs, you know, so students will step inside the door and they'll be screened right there by the Shaw. And so we're going to look at, you know, their symptoms as well. And if we see that those symptoms meet the criteria for a COVID-like illness, we're seeing things like fevers, sore throats, you know, aches. 
all of those other runny noses, all of those symptoms, um, shortness of breath, those pieces um, that we know aren't attributed to another condition. Students who meet that criteria will then be sent to a designated isolation area in each school has identified that those isolation areas and immediately parents will be called to pick up their student and any siblings that are in any of our other schools must also leave as well when we suspect a COVID like illness. Health clinics are the reason that we're screening kids before they come into the health clinic is we need to make sure that our health clinics are, are um, reserved for the regular routine functions of a health clinic, like making sure that we're able to, to do first aid if we need it, making sure that kids are um, able to get their medication safely. We've got students who need diabetes care and allergy support. So we need for our health clinics to not be isolation areas full of sick children. We need for, for our health clinics to really help support the um, health and wellness functioning of the building. That's what isolation areas are for. In our isolation areas, every school has identified an isolation area. It is fully stocked with um, personal protective equipment for anyone who will be supervising. We provided training for how to, how to don and doff the PPE for, in, for all of our staff who will um, be utilizing that equipment, including those staff members who might be identified to help us supervise in the isolation area. So that student will remain in there and they'll be supervised. So there'll be eyes and ears on the student. And again, they have to wear full PPE, which means they have to wear gloves, a disposable gown, mask and a face shield. And again, we have a separate set of PPE supplies for the isolation areas should we have to utilize those. The next piece is what is going to happen when we have a positive case in our schools. And when we are notified that we have a positive case impacting our school, we get notified by the health department. That's who um, triggers that information. Any positive COVID test result, regardless of where the person received the test, if it is a positive result, all of those results go back to um, the residing health district for where that person lives, as well as where that person may have been exposed. So when once the health department lets us know, the next thing that will happen is all impacted students and staff will go into a two day pause. This is a pause in in-person attendance, not in learning. Virtual instruction will occur. This is why that flexibility is so important in being able to move back and forth because if we do have to move into a pause because we get a COVID positive, then we will send an alert to all the paused parties as soon as possible. And we are working with um, Mr. Brett to utilize the division's Apogee. Um, I hope I'm saying that right. The, um, we have a uh, wonderful application that can shoot out those messages. And then we will also follow up for anybody who doesn't receive that. And the a pause in this two day pause occurs for two specific reasons. The first is to allow for contact tracing to occur. The second is to allow for the school division to have time to do deep cleaning. So when we go on pause, all classrooms and buses in impacted areas will be deep cleaned and our staff will work with the health department to facilitate the contact tracing. We've been um, working with Jeannie Seabridge and with our school staff to make sure that we have as much information in PowerSchool, which is our student information system. And there's now a, an amazing report that's in there that's called contact tracing. So when this occurs, we can quickly, we can quickly, uh, quickly click on it and we can gather a student schedule. We can gather all the rosters that we need so we know who was involved. And then we also are collecting schedules, seating charts, um, and the contact information so that we can quickly get that information to the health department so that we can have a um, quick turnaround for contact tracing. Con the, um, containment division, um, which conducts all the contact tracing um, with the health department, now has specific containment um, teams 
for school division. So there's a specific group. So they have they have um, trained and, and created a special group within the health department to address school exposures. The health department leads all the contact tracing. They make contact to determine who is exposed and they will determine who remains quarantined for 14 school days. And anyone who is not exposed will come right back after that two day pause. Now, I know this is a little, is a little uh, complex and so I've got a couple of examples because this is new information for a lot of folks. Again, all positive test results go to the health department all employees are also required to report to their supervisor if they or anyone in their household is tested positive. Parents should also report to the school if their student or anyone in their household tests positive. And we have systems in place for working with the health department and contact tracing occurs seven days a week. School officials are also notified immediately. So we've got some new vocabulary that we have to learn as we talk through this. Um, process for when we have positive cases in schools. A pause, again, is that brief two-day pause in in-person learning. So everybody will stay home that's identified in the pause group, and they will do virtual learning. This, again, allows us time for deep cleaning, contact tracing to go on. And exposure is when you are within six feet for 15 minutes, masked or unmasked, within two days of symptoms. They also look at that piece and exposure to respiratory droplets. Again, the, the contact tracers with the health department will talk to the folks who are involved and they will make the determination regarding exposure. The case is the person who tested positive. Anyone who tests positive goes immediately into isolation. In a direct contact is anyone who has interacted with the case, anyone who has had direct contact with the positive person. They would all be paused for two days. They're only quarantined if they're determined to be an exposure. Anyone who's not exposed comes back after two days. Contacts of contacts don't have to be paused. So for example, if I was the positive person and Mr. Anderson and I had a meeting together, he would be considered a direct contact. And then if he went to then met with Miss Russell, Miss Russell would then be a contact of a contact because she did not have direct contact with me, who was the actual positive person. I hope that makes sense to everyone. Okay. All right, again, Pausing only occurs if there's a positive COVID result that impacts our school division. And pausing will include all the staff and students in the class, where that positive case is a member or interacted, their bus group, any extracurricular activities or clubs, sports that they participate in, if they go to before and after school daycare, and anyone who could potentially be a direct contact, and again, contacts of contacts do not pause. Okay, your next slide. So what would this look like if we had a positive case in our schools? This first example is an elementary school student. And so Rebecca's in the fourth grade. She is in Mrs. Smith's class for the AM group. She tests positive. She's going into isolation. Then she also goes to a reading intervention group with Mr. Jones. She also goes to daycare before school and she rides the blue bus home in the afternoon. So what would happen in that scenario? The direct contacts paused in this example would be Mrs. Smith's class. So the teachers and the AM students, because they all had were considered to be direct contacts at that point. Rebecca's inter reading intervention group, so it would be Mr. Jones and the students in Rebecca's group. Not all the kids in their classes, just the students in that group, because they would be direct contacts with Rebecca. Rebecca's daycare group, so that would be her counselor and her students. Um, the students in her daycare group and the blue bus driver, the aide and the riders. So those groups would potentially go on a pause. Then what would happen, we would share that information with the health department. The health department would work through the contact tracing process 
and then with their containment team. And then we would potentially have 50 people who were paused due to being a direct contact. Contact tracing showed no exposures. So 50 people return after the pause. So that means zero people remain in quarantine. Rebecca remains, remains in isolation and her siblings, if she has siblings that live in her house, they would also remain in quarantine. So the next example that we have is if a teacher tests positive or a staff member tests positive. So our example here is Mr. Carey is a first grade teacher who tests positive. So Mr. Carey goes into isolation. He teaches an AM group and a PM group of students on his roster. He has a math group of students um, that come from other first grade classrooms because they regroup for math. He also has a special ed teacher and an ESOL teacher who co-teaches with him. And he has a para that comes in in the afternoon. So in this scenario, the, the groups that would pause would be Mr. Carey's AM and PM groups because they all have direct contact with him. The students from any other classes that attend his math group. So again, it's only the students from his math group, not the other classes. It's only his class and the kids in his math group the special education teacher, the ESOL teacher, and the paraprofessional. Those would be identified as the direct contacts. In this example, we have 40 staff and students who were paused due to being direct contacts. The health department did their contact tracing. It showed two exposures. So 38 would return after the two-day pause, two remain in quarantine, and Mr. Carey remains in isolation. So that's how pausing works. This pausing is really um, is, is critical when we have a positive case because it allows us time as a school division to clean. It also allows the health department the 24 to 48 hours they need to do the contact tracing so that we can, again, box in the disease and stop the spread. So the health department will notify all the parties regarding their status of an exposure. Any party that doesn't hear from the health department will be clear to return. All information is kept confidential and private. School closures will be determined by the, um, our school division in collaboration with the health department. And it all depends on the context of the situation. I know that's a question that a lot of folks have. When will you close? Is it one case? Is it two cases? Is it four cases? It really depends upon the context of the situation, it, which includes the number of cases, the sources of exposure be Im impacted. So those are all pieces that would, um, that would help make that decision and that's done with the school division and the health department. A general notification regarding results of any event is going to be provided to the school community so that we have transparency. So notifications are going to be made when we have to go on a pause and then um, a general notification regarding the results at the end of the event will also be shared so that everybody knows it, what's going on in that we can all act on fact and information rather than rumor. And so I'm hoping that that'll help because the, you know, this, it's a complex process. So that covers the pausing and the important things to remember about that. So did you want to stop here? Well, I'll, I'll finish up with the next steps here okay. and then, and then we'll wrap up for questions. Um, you know, our, our big next steps right now, um, actually, before I do that, let me, let me just hone in on one thing that, that Ms. Sharp said that I think is super important because it could become a concern in our community, just knowing uh, um, any community, not just our community, um, is if someone decides to um, either post on social media or I heard so-and-so's kid had COVID-like symptoms and it could really create a stir in the community, that doesn't close school. What closes uh, or what constitutes a pause is only a positive case. It's not whether somebody had COVID-like symptoms or not. It's only if there's a positive case. So I wanna make sure that that, I know she said that a couple of times, but I, I wanna just be really clear about that. Um, and it's gonna take some gumption for all of us not to, not to flinch on it because it, you know, we really need to act on, on solid data. Um, but our, our next steps are to gather the data from uh, the learning intent forms. Um, as we sat here tonight, we got 25 more that came in. So they continue to roll in. Um, we're gonna assign those families to AMPM and notify them um, as quickly as we possibly can. 
um, the school admin teams and their teachers, um, and this is Tim and Paul and Amanda and Jeremy are working really closely with their teachers on daily class schedules, and looking at those instructional needs for their kids, um, continuing to collaborate with our stakeholders, monitoring our health data. Again, we not only meet with the county health department, we meet with the VDOE once a week, and we also now have um, all of the good data that's up and available for us and then continue to prep and complete the process for operations, which means building the bus routes, making sure that we have um, all the food services ready, making sure that our daycare is ready to rock and roll, our cleaning supplies are all in. Uh, and then after that, we'll begin working on the secondary reopening and, and be ready for that round of students. So, um, so with that, uh, Chair Anderson, we will we'll end our presentation. We have gone a lot longer than I anticipated, but um, I do think the questions have been good. Uh, and hopefully helpful um, to all of you. And um, we are, we're here and available to any, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Um, I will look around the room metaphorically for questions and I see that Ms. Litton and uh, Ms. Downs and Vice Chair Russell all have their hands up. So Ms. Litton first, then Ms. Downs, then Vice Chair Russell. Great, thank you, Chair Anderson. I just have a question about how we ex back to um, provide instruction if either a teacher is sick or a teacher has to quarantine for an extended period of time? Kind of what are the scenarios for addressing those two situations? So it's a great question. And we've actually had a circumstance with that already. We had a teacher who did test positive and was quarantining. Um, and had we been in person, um, that teacher would quarantine, the students would still come to school and we would put a substitute in the classroom. Um, we are determined to maintain sort of our bubble. So we are working through the substitute process, um, looking at paraprofessionals, looking at other teachers. Um, and then we have a list and, uh, that we will go down to make sure that we um, have people to cover classes. And I, I too, as the superintendent, am on that list. So if a classroom needs to be covered, um, and we can't find somebody, I'll be in the room covering the classroom. But um, we're gonna try as best we can to cover them internally as opposed to going externally. And that is um, for the safety and, and health of our, of our community. Great, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Litton. Um, Ms. Downs and then Vice Chair Russell. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, Ms. Sharp. As always, an impressive presentation. I have a few questions. Um, the first is uh, in terms of immunizations. I know that uh, we had quite a few, I think students mostly at MEH, maybe the sixth grade level who missed some um, immunizations. How is that going? Are we reaching out to students who are, and I know MEH isn't coming back till later, but are we um, reaching out actively to those families who need to get immunizations done? We are. Um, I've worked, I've been working uh, basically on a weekly basis with all of our registrars who have done an amazing job of reaching out to families. And, you know, and we've also provided information to all of our families on immunization clinics. We've also provided the links for, you know, places where, you know, they can go get free immunizations and, you know, trying to really help support our families in getting this done because we have to be in compliance with this. And it's really critical because, again, we don't want to layer on more sickness on top of a pandemic. So all of our registrars have been emailing and calling families. And I'm going yeah, to with you. I'm going to add to um, what Ms. Sharp said, and that is that um, in order to be in com compliance, all students, regardless of the service delivery, even if it's virtual, they have to have immunization. So we now are at a point, unfortunately, where we've given a, a core number of families um, a deadline of this Friday to get immunizations. Otherwise, we're going to have to take them out of school, unfortunately. But we are working with every family individually. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Uh, and, I, you know, one of the things I'm on uh, the local Little League board, and one of the things we did um, was we had us uh, players before they went to their games and practices fill out an online Google sheet, which was sort of a health, which was a health screening before they would go to their practices. So 
are are um the health screening you spoke of is that more of just something that um is an honor system that the the we expect the families to go through this every morning um i'm assuming we're not having them fill anything out is that right that is correct it is an honor system uh, we contemplated a Google form daily, but from an operational standpoint, it was too complex with um, 2,600 students ultimately coming back. So we are counting on the better the better angels of people in the City of Falls Church to do the right thing, uh, and hope that they will um, keep their kids home if they're sick and and monitor the students' health. That's understandable. It might be, um, and you probably have thought about this, but maybe as we get closer doing a one pager um, and sending that out to the community that they could print and just put on their refrigerator, um, you know, to look, I figured you had that <laughs> covered. <laughs> what a great idea. <laughs> great minds think alike. Uh, okay, two more questions. Um, when, in terms of the closure, um, when we're talking about, um, you know, there's been a couple incidents of, um, you know, cases at a certain one of the schools, do we also look at the overall health data metrics or are we just looking simply at occurrences at that school. So if we have maybe one or, you know, a couple in a couple of classrooms at Mount Daniel, but overall the health data metrics are still good. Do we look at that too? We, we will, I thought you were going to ask the other direction where oh. <laughs> there were maybe one or two cases in the school, but the health metrics were going in a completely different direction. Getting right. um, if, if the health metrics are good, and we have one or two cases at the schools and we use the pause process that that Ms. Sharp described, we would we would we wouldn't do anything other than continue with that process. Okay. If the health data begins to go north and becomes more problematic and we start to see trend and burden numbers going up, we can always pull back and go back to online. And that's the that's the beauty of this model is that we have the flexibility to do either or. Right. So my hope is again, it sort of it sort of goes to our our community and the importance of all of us working together and sort of that that compact that we have with each other that we're going to keep each other safe. Right. Um, because if our health metrics go a different direction, we we would dial back if we have to. Right. And and by looking at it on a weekly basis, it's not like all of a sudden we're going to be shocked or surprised. We can as we see it to start inch up. Yep. We can notify people, hey, we've got to keep a lid on this, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then my last, I guess, just more comment um, is just, you know, I, I've had so many um, leaders of uh, SAOs reach out to me. How can we help? What can we do to help? So just, I know you all know, but if there are things like you need help with, you know, if, if after the first week we realize we need more hands on deck with temperature checks and that sort of thing, um, you know, the SAOs are, are there and have a, there's a legion of volunteers ready to help. So thank you all for your great work. We appreciate the, the volunteer spirit of the SAOs. I, I had a conversation last night at the foundation meeting with folks um, and a number of the SAOs were there as well. Um, and the same reach out. And, and one of the things that I think is particularly hard for us right now is identifying exactly what our needs are. Um, but as, as time progresses, um, we know, we know, sort of, we have, we'll have a better sense of what they are. But for now, knowing that our staff is coming back, um, you know, I'm, I, I said, you know, are there ways we can roll out the red carpet, so to speak, for them when they do return um, those first couple of weeks to, you know, whether it's, you know, box lunches or, you know, things right. like that would be really, really nice, I think. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kasich likes that idea. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Downs. Um, Vice Chair Russell, you had your hand up and I'm looking for others as well. I see Ms. Snyder, you have your hand up too, thanks. Um, thank you. So this is a question, I guess, for Ms. Sharp and I don't know if you are getting down to this level of detail, but I was just curious if we're gonna have um, established guidance with regard to masks. Um, I mean, obviously we're not gonna require N95, but I'm just curious, cause I know there's a wide range of effectiveness with regard to face coverings from the you know people who just wear the bandana or the buff versus the double cloth. So I'm just curious if there's gonna be any kind of guidance that we're gonna put around that. Well, we follow the CDC guidelines and you know the masks that are out there. I think if we see kids and staff members with masks that aren't appropriate or 
aren't a lot of it honestly miss russell is the masks just don't fit appropriately and mm -hmm. so we've also worked with the um health department regarding guidance on you know n95s and those are not appropriate for the school setting mm -hmm. You know, so it, it, it's going to be, and if we see, if we see, you know, kids don't have, you know, the appropriate mask, then we've got extras at the schools. So we'll be able to give them extras. And okay. Yeah. Them. I was just curious because I'm, I'm yeah. sure you've seen the, the mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure you've seen the Bill Nye Science Guy video where he yeah. does the different masks. And yeah. so there's obviously a big difference between, you know, just like the thin pieces of cotton or a bandana versus you know even the double woven cotton mask so I just want to make sure that we have some sort of I guess bar that we're setting with regard to that yeah we've also been clear about no masks with the um the some of them that they make with a little vent in them those are <laughs> not it, it, we, we've been explicit about that as well that that's not okay a, and so we're, we're not going to allow the Lana Del Rey mesh mask either <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, ma'am. No, the Empress no, okay. in the school wearing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Russell. Uh, Ms. Snyder, I saw you had your hand up. Yes. Um, so I have a couple of questions. I'll ask them separately because they're kind of different. Um, the first question was what is the specific protocol relating to visitors? Because I think um, Ms. Russell had, or maybe Ms. Downs had mentioned um, SAOs having parents come and help with temperature checks and such things. So would that possibly like complicate contact tracing? Yes, so it's a really good question, Ms. Snyder. Um, we, we are really going to limit visitors to our schools um, inside the building in particular. So if there are some things that can be done outside and safely um, as students walk in or as staff walk in, that may be one thing, but um, really limiting visitors into the building. Um, so we're gonna ask, um, for example, and this is gonna be a challenge for us culturally, but we're gonna ask that parents um, really not come in the buildings and that visitors don't come in the buildings because we do wanna maintain that, that bubble as best we can. And my second question isn't so much as a question as a comment that everything seems to be so well planned out that it's making me think back to the public, some of the public comments we got today, um, talking about bringing back some of the high school students. I know this is taking our conversation a little bit of a different direction, but there has been a lot of talk among Mason students, especially seniors, about going back right after winter break. And that's just something that I guess. I'm happy to address it for you, Ms. Snyder. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think it's a really good question. Um, I, I would, the only thing I, I would start with is just reminding the board that we did put the calendar together pre-COVID. Um, and so pre-COVID, we had scheduled to have a teacher work day right after the winter break to make the transition back to the school. And then we would just step right in as, as though nothing had happened moving from one building to the other. Um, it's a remarkably different thing to uh, move from one building to another and now looking at a hybrid type solution because I'm, I'm pretty sure that at winter break, after winter break, we would come back in a hybrid. Um, so, so knowing the complications of that, um, I, we're hearing from the staff that there is a need for a little bit more time to really get settled into the new building, get acclimated to the, to the streaming solutions and the like. Um, and it's not as easy as some people might say to open one building and not the other because there's an awful lot of crossover between the two staff and between the two groups of students at the middle and the high school in terms of who gets services. Um, so, so that was the, the reality of moving it to the end of the first, uh, at, at the end of the second quarter. However, um, we, we've, heard, we've heard you, um, our seniors, we've heard, uh, we got a letter tonight from a core group of students as well. We've heard from some of the parents. Um, I've spoken with uh, Mr. Hills and Ms. Hardy and we're open to revisiting that conversation. I don't know that we can pull it off before the 21st, but we are certainly open to looking at it. Um, but we still may need some time after the winter break to get settled in, get used to the technology um, and understand the building a little bit more. So um, 
So again, we're really open to that. But the thing that we're trying to accomplish also is creating opportunities for students to come together before that for groups, activities, um, and the like, so that some of the social and emotional, um, you know, things can be taken care of. So, um, so all of that to say that um, we'll be meeting and continuing that conversation. I can't commit to anything tonight without having uh, Mr. Hills and Ms. Hardy on board, but I do want you to know that we hear you and that uh, we'll, work, we'll work hard to, to see what we can do. Thank you so much. That makes perfect sense. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Um, I will ask, are there any questions from anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? Um, as I'm looking around the room. And I'm just checking my list of questions to see. The one, I think, question that we talked a little bit about, Dr. Newton, but not, not in a great detail is, um, and it's come, up in, it's come up in conversations in the community as well, substitutes. Um, do we actually have enough? And what happens if we run into a situation where we, where we don't? Um, you know, we just simply don't have the people available on a given day. Something bad has happened. I don't know what it would be. We have a, we have a very deep bench um, to include. We, you know, we, we are going to start with our paraprofessionals. Um, we will compensate our paraprofessionals for the time that they spend in the classroom as a substitute. Um, but they are our best first line of defense. They know the schools that they're in. They know many of the kids that are there. Um, and we are gonna look to them to help support our, our move um, into uh, the sub pool. If, if there is a scenario where we run out of paraprofessionals from across the division and we need to bring other people in, um, our next line of defense is uh, Jeremy and Amanda uh, and some of our specialists. We've got a reading specialist, we've got a math specialist. Uh, if those folks aren't enough to cover it, then we'll move into central office. And we have Julie Macrina and Jen Santiago, and we've got um, myself and Mr. Bates. Um, we were all excellent, excellent teachers and, and still consider ourselves excellent teachers. So when you look at the depth chart, if you will, um, we are about 40 people deep before we run out of substitutes. Um, and I, I'm confident that uh, if we ended up needing 40 substitutes, I'm fairly confident that we would be closing. Thanks. That was actually sort of what I thought the, the end would be, right? If we reach that point, it's, it's, it's something else going on. Something but, else is happening if we have 40 people out at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess I'll look around for other questions from other, other members who haven't, uh, haven't really had a chance to chime in yet. All right, um, if not, I would like to follow up on the face covering question. Um, so the, Ms. Sharp, in your presentation, you were talking about um, the, basically the expectation is that um, students, staff uh, will be wearing face coverings at all times. Um, is there, are there sets of conditions where, where a face covering could be removed? For instance, if somebody is alone in a private office um, or if someone, a teacher is alone in their classroom, is that something that that, that can do? Um, are there other conditions? And, and then I guess I have a follow-on question, but I'll, I'll stop there for now. Yeah, those are both great examples. And we've shared that with staff that if you're alone in your classroom and your door is closed, you can take your mask down. If, you know, when I go to work at, at central office and I work in my office, my door is closed and I can take my mask down. We're also going to have, you know, uh, you know, mass stamina and mass fatigue is a real, is a real issue. And so we, we really need to help people. And if, if you need to step six, 10 feet away and you need to pull your mask down for a second, or you need to step outside and get some fresh air, then, you know, we encourage that. We encourage it for staff. And we encourage it for kids too. Okay, thanks. That's that's helpful to know because um, you know it is a it is a long thing to get through a full day like that. Um, Can I have one? Go to ahead. That. Um, just as an example, I, I was in a classroom today with a student where developmentally it didn't make sense for the student to wear a mask. Um, it was a two-year-old at our preschool, so that student wasn't wearing a mask. Um, we have another student who is in our life skills program 
um, who isn't able to wear a mask. And so in, in that circumstance, the staff said, we're gonna modify and the student won't wear a mask, but we'll up our PPE. And so they put a, they put a, a face shield on because it wasn't developmentally appropriate for the life skills students to, student, that particular student to be wearing a mask. So there are circumstances where it doesn't make sense, but for the vast majority, it is an expectation that our students and our staff wear their mask at all times. And if there is a circumstance where a staff member um, isn't able to maintain their mask, we will um, you know, follow the progressive practices that we use when staff aren't following directions, um, which very rarely happens, um, but ultimately it could end up in, in a discipline situation um, if a staff member continues to refuse it. Uh, just like if a student were to refuse to wear a mask um, and didn't have issues um, that were developmentally um, appropriate, we could move that student to online. Um, and they could stay online until they're ready to come back and wear a mask. And so that, that's sort of how serious we are about making sure that everybody wears a mask. Thank you, Dr. Nina. Thank you, Ms. Sharp. That's, that's exactly the, the info I was looking for. Um, all right, at this point, I think I'm gonna bring this, uh, this portion of the meeting to a close. Um, and I would like to, to say on behalf of the board, thank you to all of you. Um, both for, for all of the work that has gone into a very detailed and thorough and thoughtful plan for the communications that you uh, have shared with the community to share this plan. And then um, also for being here tonight to help us understand it in more detail and answer the questions that, that we are hearing and that we have to make sure we understand it. So I wanna say thank you to all of you for that. Very much appreciated. And thank you for being here tonight, so. With that, we will go ahead and move to our next item on the agenda, um, item 7.02, which is an update on the school renaming. And um, Mayor Anderson, Dr. Nini, yes. Can I can I just say to the school folks if they need to go to, to get on get on going and go to bed? Oh yes, sorry. Thank you for thank you for that. Thank you very much for being here. We very much appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, good night. All right, so we'll go ahead to the school renaming um, update. And on this one, um, it's gonna be a, the intention is to give an update to make sure everybody is aware of, of how things have been refined since our meeting on the 6th and make sure folks know what's, what's ready to go. Um, I'm just gonna give a very brief overview and then I'm gonna be um, calling on uh, Vice Chair Russell and, and Ms. Downs in particular for, um, for conversation for some updates on how things have gone with the survey and with developing a set of communications to go out to the community. I can talk a little bit about how we're dealing with the, um, with the public hearings and then we'll wrap it up a little bit with the website which kind of brings everything all together. Really the intention is to give an update on this one. Um, I wanna start by saying thank you um, to a number of people who, are, who have been really critical to get us to the point where we are now. Um, I, I do wanna look at Vice Chair Russell and Ms. Downs and say thank you, uh, particularly for the work that you've been doing because you have been picking up a, a big chunk of this. But I also wanna thank um, Mr. Brett and Ms. Minson and Ms. Goodell for uh, a whole set of, of conversations that we've needed to have and to refine things and for the work of getting things up onto the web and getting emails out and advice on how to phrase things in appropriate ways. So I just wanna say thank you for, for all the work that you've done. And I know um, that others on staff have been involved as well. And I wanna say thank you to them as well. So that's sort of where I wanna start. Um, what I wanted to do is, is just let you know that those things have happened. So the um, next thing I wanna ask is, Vice Chair Russell, will you talk a little bit about where things are with the survey? Cause I think that's, a, that's the next big chunk and then I'll talk a little bit about the hearings and then as Downs, we'll talk about the communications because this is where I wrap things up. So, Vice Chair Russell, will you go ahead? Um, sure, so I guess I'll, I'll try not to overlap too much with Ms. Downs because um, there is quite a bit of overlap in our roles and we've had to work pretty closely to get some of these things taken care of. Um, but ultimately the survey was approved. And so I believe everyone on here, maybe not Mr. Webb, um, would have gotten a pre-communication message today. Um, so the pre-communication messages, and I'm not excluding you, Mr. Webb, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, but it just went to the students 
um, letting them know that the survey is coming out tomorrow. The parents who have and the guardians who have an email and file with um, FCCPS um, and then uh, staff, so faculty and staff. And so all of those people would have just gotten a heads up that the survey is launching tomorrow. Um, so the next step is the actual survey will launch tomorrow. And so um, if you're in the parent or staff faculty group, um, you'll get a link or a message with a one-time um, single use link to the survey. Um, if you're in the student group, that's a little trickier. Um, and that actually will be going out by Mr. Brett will be sending it um, to the students and they have, will have a link that they click on. And then the way they log in is actually through their um, FCCPS student email. So, um, and then the other part, and I guess this is where I kind of have some overlap with Ms. Downs, is we've been working on the community outreach. So there'll be a, or there is a URL on the website that you can click on to take the survey when it goes live, um, which I believe is gonna be tomorrow morning or midnight tonight. Um, and then also Ms. Downs has been working on a number of outreach with regard to the community and making sure that we're pushing out the URL option um, in the news press. And I guess I'll let her talk a little bit about the, the outreach that she's gonna do with regard to the survey. Thank you, Vice Chair Russell. I appreciate that uh, update for everyone. Um, Ms. Downs, why don't you go ahead and talk about the communications? Cause this is also wrapped up with the survey and then I can, I'll, I'll go in on the other couple of items. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Anderson and, and Vice Chair Russell. Uh, yeah, our, our emails went out today and um, tomorrow in morning announcements, um, Mr. Brett and Ms. Carol Sly are going to run an ad for us just to announce the survey opening. Um, the surveys uh, for the students, um, I, they will be sent um, and Mr. Brett will be, <laughs> Sean and I will be sending you that email tomorrow morning, but um, that will go, we will send the surveys um, to the students in the um, K-12 Insight, we'll send it to the other uh, constituents. And then during the day, um, the school day at different times, Mason students and MEH students will take those surveys. So the it'll run in morning announcements uh, tomorrow. And the, yes, the key piece is the community piece. And so, uh, Mr. Webb, this is where you come in as a as a community member, uh, not a not a parent. Um, we are going to run an ad in the Falls Church uh, News Press this Thursday. And thank you again to Mr. Brett for his help on that. And so that just announces the survey to the community and then we'll give um, the website link. We're really trying to drive everyone to the website um, because there is where we, we are gonna talk about um, the, the cost information that I think Mr. Anderson will go over in a minute, um, as well as the history of these two men and um, the timeline for the process and more information about our hearing. So we're just trying to really drive everyone to the website. Um, but once they get there, um, we are trying to make sure that if a parent receives an individual link, that they're using that link that they received in their email and not going to the public survey. So there's a little bit of, uh, and, and Shauna, Ms. Russell did a great job trying to make sure that people understand that they should use the parent link that was sent to them. Um, and so after, in terms of, we'll run that ad on Thursday, and then we're also going to, I'm in touch with um, the city's newsletter, the Focus on Falls Church newsletter, as well as maybe as some different community organizations. I'm gonna reach out to uh, Mary Beth Connolly and just try to get it out as many places as we can. So alumni and community members um, understand that they are able to participate in this survey. So it'll be an ongoing, we just, this push this week has really just been to announce that the survey has launched. Um, but it will be an ongoing thing in morning announcements and then also continuing in the news press and their calendar section, just trying to make sure we reach the community as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Um, and thank you uh, for taking on this, uh, this big chunk of getting the outreach out to everyone and getting the word out as we need to. Um, before we talk about the hearings, one piece that's associated with the survey, and we heard some of it from tonight's public comments and from prior ones that people were particularly wanting to hear information related to what costs may be um, related to a name change if we were to make the decision to do such thing, change either name. And so Dr. Noonan has prepared some information for us on 
estimated cost that's available on board docs now and it's linked off the website that we were just talking about so i don't know dr Nino, at this point would you uh, be able to walk us through those cost estimates and then we'll talk wrap it up with hearings on the website yeah happy to um and to be clear i, I want to thank miss michael she and her team actually did a lot of the legwork on this um so uh, miss michael do you want to project that and, and the way that this costing sheet was put together was looking at both Thomas Jefferson and George Mason High School. Um, so as that comes up, um, the only frame I would give um, for this is that it, we had used um, as, an, as an algorithm, if you will, or as a proxy, um, the renaming sheet that came out a while ago that came to us from uh, the renaming of Justice High School. And so we looked at the different categories that Justice used uh, and um, were able to kind of extrapolate out from that and try to build in other things that may be missing. So I'm gonna talk about the top line and then um, Ms. Michael can kind of walk you through the next section. So let me start with the, the name change mascot, colors remain the same. Um, and that was something that I think that the board was really clear about right from the beginning was that um, if, the, if the decision is to change the name, um, that the mascot would remain um, the Mustang and would remain the tiger, uh, the colors would still be orange and blue and red and black. Um, and because of that, um, some of the costs uh, were, were, do come down because of that. Um, but when you look at it in terms of um, athletics, capital and school-wide, um, you'll see uh, working across the top with respect to athletics, uniforms and equipment are estimated to cost about $96,760. Uh, there are no uh, additional uniform costs at um, Thomas Jefferson um, because there aren't uniforms for athletics. However, if there are uniforms for the following year for PE or for other things, those get repurchased every year anyway. Um, exterior signage. Uh, at Thomas Jefferson, there would be an approximately $7,000 expenditure to change the name there to, to uh, change out the two signs that say Thomas Jefferson. At the high school, there wouldn't be any additional cost uh, because there is not a, a sign currently on the new building. Um, and that has been um, currently postponed until a decision is made um, temporarily, and, but we'll be ready for whatever the, the name is, whether it's George Mason or something new. Um, in ter terms of interior signage, um, this is the second sign at, at Thomas Jefferson is approximately $6,000 and you might um, recognize it when you walked in. It's sort of the, the book um, fan, uh, if you will, with the Thomas Jefferson Elementary School and that would uh, be about $6,000. And again, interior signage at the new high school wouldn't cost anything uh, additional. Um, and then with respect to stationary and forms and all other sort of administrative costs that go with that, whether it's changing addresses, changing names and things like that, um, we anticipate that at Thomas Jefferson, it would be about $500. Um, but because the high school's address changed um, and because there would potentially, well, we'll just say this, because the high school's address changed, um, all of the stationary, which is gonna have to change anyway, um, and there are uh, changes that need to be done administratively. So um, the additional costs would already be borne uh, from making those changes. So there wouldn't be any additional uh, costs to change from school-wide. So if you look at it in terms of totals, um, the estimated total to change the name at Thomas Jefferson Elementary would be $13,500. And then to change the high school name would be 96,760 which is just, um, the, just the athletics uh, uniforms. And so Ms. Michael has delineated and detailed out the costs of those. I don't know if you want us to go line by line, but I'll turn it over to Ms. Michael so she can kind of give you an overview of what this table shows. So I have to give a huge shout out to Marvin Wooten. He's our new athletic director at the high school and he did all of this leg work. So he literally went through every single uniform and had to look at both the tops and bottoms. So um, just to use one sport as an example for cross country, for example, the bottoms don't have the name George Mason on them. So you'll see that there's no number of bottoms but the tops do say George Mason. So 35 tops would need to be replaced. When we look at other pieces related to the sport, that can be a variety of things, whether it's a bag that has, you know, um, George Mason and the team logo on it, 
or um, socks or some other component related to the uniform, those are in other. Um, then he calculated the estimated cost by reaching out to our supply vendor for replacing those. And then we multiplied the cost for each of those pieces by the number we would need to replace. So you can see in this top line of the chart for cross country boys, we had 35 uniform tops that needed to be replaced at $20 each and four other pieces of equipment that were valued or materials valued at $40 each. So that's $860. Um, and then this total chart gets to that $96,760 that Dr. Noonan referenced. For this current school year, due to the pandemic, um, our athletic competitions haven't yet started. So we haven't replaced anything this year. Um, so we do have our um, funding available this year that could um, be used to replace these uniforms. I mean, there's funding of, of just about $45,000 just in that one line item um, that could help to cover some of these costs um, as well as additional um, other funding that could be used. Um, but this chart looks at every single sport and then the very last line had equipment as well. So of that total 15,000 was miscellaneous equipment. So for example, the padded chairs that people sit on, um, the scores table, other things like that, that have George Mason and not just the Mustang on them. Thank you very much, Ms. Michael. And thank you, Dr. Noonan. Um, are there questions from members uh, on this cost information? And I see Ms. Downs, you, you have your hand up, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Ms. Michael. Uh, this is terrific. One, um, I guess, request, you know, for someone who is not as familiar with our budget, um, you know, this isn't, this is hard to put into context. And uh, Ms. Michael, you always do such a great job helping us understand the budget. And I know in Noonan's notes, we talked a little bit, or not we, Dr. Noonan talked a little bit about, um, you know, how, and, and you just mentioned it yourself about how some of these costs, I, I think there's, uh, a lot of the public um, that I've, you know, letters I've read and talking to people are worried about what will be cut to do this. What do we have to cut to make this happen? And I know that in Dr. Noonan's recent communication of the school board, he talked about, um, just as you said, some of this funding we, we already do have. And then also we can split things between two fiscal years. So I was, um, I guess a request would be, is there any way that maybe to this slide or, some, or somewhere, we can provide maybe a paragraph putting things in context so that the public um, can, it can help the public understand that we, we don't necessarily need to slash this and slash that, you know, we might need to trim a little bit here and there, but overall we can find, um, the, if that's the case, the funding. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Um, I think we can certainly, and certainly with the website available, we can provide that context in a place that people can find it. And so if we can have some sort of brief summary, that will definitely be useful, I think. Other comments or questions on this cost information from anyone? Uh, Dr. Dimmick. Hi, I guess I've been thinking about cost a bit and, and I guess I would encourage folks that we shouldn't let cost be a factor in determining whether or not we change names if we choose to change one or more names, I'm a patient person. I, I can wait until we find money to do things. Um, I think changing a name is different from the cost of the issue. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Um, other comments or questions on this cost info? Mr. Webb. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I share the uh, first with uh, Ms. Downs, just making sure that that information is out there and some some contextualization of it is there so that folks know that we're big chunks of the money are, are already there. And that it wouldn't be a we're going to take from here or cut from here to pay for any of these things. Um, and then two, I also want to to echo um, Ms. Demick, um, I, cost is a very important factor. However, uh, if we choose to, as a community, make these name changes, I don't think cost should be the driving force of doing this. It should be recognizing what our community and what our students potentially, uh, that what that we may glean from the surveys that are going out as of tomorrow um, should be the driving force of ultimately what we 
uh, the decision that we ultimately made. But um, I don't think cost should be a driving force. However, I get and understand um, that there are community members who would like to make sure that we are focused on the overall education portions for our students uh, and make sure those areas are not gonna be impacted by this. And I think this the, the work that is done by uh, Mr. Wooten and Ms. Michael uh, is a great starting point to show uh, some of that for us. And I do appreciate the work that you all have done, uh, for particularly Mr. Wooten being the new guy on the block of pulling out tops and bottoms and counting and doing all that. I really do appreciate uh, th that added layer that he did of, of getting that, um, making sure that we're pretty accurate on what we're, we're talking about here. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, Vice Chair Russell. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So just as the liaison for the sports boosters, I guess I kind of wanted to add a little bit more context around this and explain that um, typically the way it works with regard to uniforms is if I recall, they're on a five-year cycle. Um, so while there are some aspects of this where things would have already been included in Mr. Wooten's budget for the coming year um, and would have been replaced anyway. Um, it's certainly not all of them and it's actually a very um, small portion of them. So we do get a lot of use out of our uniforms. Um, and you know, with regard to the overall cost, um, I think that Ms. Down's question or suggestion to Ms. Michaels is a good one. Um, but one of the things I guess that I would definitely want the board and the public to keep in mind, um, and again, not saying that cost should be the factor, um, but we are already um, looking at significant cuts to our current budget that continue to come from the city. And I would anticipate that our budget cycle that we're gonna be starting pretty soon is probably going to be pretty grim. Um, so the chances that we're going to have places to trim here and there are going to be even less than in previous years. Um, so again, I'm not suggesting that the cost be the driver for it, but I think in the overall context of just our you know, fiscal picture that we're looking at going into the next budget, um, that's definitely something that we need to keep in mind as well. Thank you, Vice Chair Russell. Um, any other questions related to cost information at this point? All right, not seeing any, um, I guess I would ask um, Dr. Noonan if we can um, get some kind of context, context for this cost information, a little bit of textual information, a paragraph that we could add to the, to the page in some sense. Um, based on the based on what was in the communication and based on on the information that Ms. Michael shared with us just now. Sure, um, Ms. Michael and I can work on that tomorrow. Okay, it won't, be, it won't be extensive, but but we will say what's available currently and give a little bit more information. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Rodinger. So, depending on what Dr. Noonan means by say what's available, I, I actually would object to simply saying that we have. $45,000 in unspent funds that could be used because I think that's a little, um, that's not fully accurate. I think the way that <clears throat> Ms. Russell described it, that we're on a five-year cycle for uniforms um, basically says that, you know, of this roughly $100,000 for uniforms um, that have insignia on them, we'd be replacing 20,000 of that year over year. So I think it's fairly, um, accurate to say that if we just used one or two cycles that part of that would be taken up but if we're um you know if we're repurposing other dollars or other unspent dollars there's still dollars that could be used for some other purpose so I, i'd be disinclined to whether or not someone believes uh that money should be a factor or not to uh being um, a little too hand wavy in terms of what's available at the actual cost. Uh, Mr. Reininger, your internet went a little bit wonky right at the end of that, but I, I think um, 
I don't know if you want to restate maybe the last 10 seconds or so. The sum and substance is just because I think cost information is important to people to be fairly precise. If we're going to start talking about what the year over year cost is about how much of this would normally be spent and how much would require um, using dollars that would normally be used for other purposes, whether or not those dollars remain unspent. So, okay. so how, um, trying to think, you know, you know there's, there's about $45,000 in the athletics budget for uniforms. Um, so is it fair to say that from a context perspective, you know, if, if the school board were to move forward with changing the name, we would have $45,000 of available money for uniforms and there would need to be $45,000 from somewhere else to be spent to pay for the balance of the, the uniform. I, I, I'm just, I guess what I'm wondering is you're asking us to write it up and I'm not exactly sure what it is that you want us to write up now. I, my suggestion at this point is that it, there's enough of an analysis here that we actually need to give a little bit more thought about what the board would actually like to see before we can really um, provide that context. I think Ms. Downs is right that additional context is necessary, but I think Mr. Reitinger and Ms. Russell are also correct that we just need to make sure that we are being precise and contextualizing it appropriately. So what I will do is um, I will reach back to the members to try to get a little bit of extra clarification about what we would actually like to have and then Dr. Newton, I'll come back to you for um, with that. That'd be fine. And, and if you and, and Ms. Downs were interested in drafting something with some blanks, you know, we could maybe fill in some of the blanks with money if that's helpful too. Okay, well, let's, um, I, I will take this as a, as a to-do for myself um, to, to reach out to folks to get a little bit better um, view of what folks would like to see in that context to make sure that we get that information put, to correctly, uh, put together correctly. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so then unless there's anything else on, on this, we basically have, um, the surveys are ready to go live and, and um, folks who are either um, really eager or, or uh, anxious may want to maybe jumping on that very quickly, but I think they go live tomorrow morning. Um, and those will be available until October 28th um, to be able to fill out for the community, for parents, for staff, faculty. Um, and we have worked with, um, th there is time set aside for students to be able to, uh, to look at surveys uh, during their school days. So there's that. Um, the other thing I wanted to make sure to bring up for everybody is the public hearings is another big element of our outreach to our community to hearing what people have to say. Um, and we've spent a fair bit of time since our meeting on the 6th refining the model for how the public hearings can work. Um, where we have ended up is that there is a, um, there will be a, there is a registration form available that people can go to to register in, uh, in advance to speak during, one, during the hearing. Um, we will be having two sessions um, for these, uh, one on the 22nd of October, one on the 29th of October, as we agreed in our last meeting. Um, and people will register in advance through this form. They will get, um, after all of the registration process is complete, um, there's going to be a pause where we need to do a little bit of processing. And then folks will get an email with a speaker number uh, and a link to be able to connect to the, to the meeting. Um, and those things are um, those things are going to come out in an email uh, after that's complete. So the the one thing that we have done as a refinement on top of um, what we had discussed last week is giving some thought to the duration of the of the hearings. And in the end, what we have is two sessions, each of which starts at six o'clock at night and goes for a maximum of four hours a night. Um, and people will have their link they will have we'll have a list on the on the list uh, on the board docs listing when we uh, the order in which people will be speaking and then people can can connect to the meeting we go forward until we get to uh, the end of the four hours and then we're going to go from there we will have to see quite frankly what the turnout is and what the registration is um, and we will 
we'll have to just sort of um, see what, if any additional adaptations need to be made to refine that. But for now, registration opens um, tomorrow. Uh, it will close at noon on October 20th, and we will have uh, up to right now eight hours set aside to, to hear uh, directly from people who want to speak with us. Um, and, uh, and so that's, the, that's kind of the, the refined model for, uh, for things on the hearing. I don't know if there's anybody has any questions about any of that right now. Mr. Webb, go ahead. I'm saying, um, can you clarify how the, the registration is going to, to go? Um, I know you and I had a conversation about it, but just to, to be clear exactly how the registration is, are we gonna register per event or register as a whole and let folks know when they're going to be, the, their day that they're gonna be um, in the mix for speaking? Thanks, Mr. Webb, for the question. So there will be one registration period open. Um, people can come in. There's a web form that they will fill out, ask for some basic information, and they'll be, uh, they'll be collected together. When the registration period closes, we'll know how many people have registered. Each person will receive a, a number for themselves as a speaker. And we will go in the order in which people have received their speaker number, except for the fact that what we, we had a suggestion to set aside um, time at the beginning of each night for uh, 10 slots at the beginning of each night for students so that students can, can say what they need to say and then be able to go on and, and do other things. Um, but people will otherwise speak in the order in which they registered. Um, we'll publish a list online of, of speaker numbers and people will be able to estimate based on a three minute duration, roughly speaking, when, when their time would come. Um, and we'll, we'll go through four hours on the first time and we'll go through four hours on the next time and we'll have to see if there are any additional adjustments we need to make. All right, other questions, other clarifications anybody would like? Okay, um, so then that brings us to the last piece. All of this, and, and Ms. Downs has, has referred to this and, and others have as well, that all of this comes together. There is a central website for the renaming um, question. Um, and Mr. Webb, thank you, sorry, uh, Mr. Brett, thank you very much for all the work that you did to help us get that up there and running. And, uh, and everyone, thank you for your contributions in, in getting this going. Um, but the, the website has in it a summary at the top. It has an update section so that people can just see that, you know, come back to the page over and over and see what's changed. And then it has information about the survey, information about the um, public hearings. Um, it has uh, in information about Thomas Jefferson and, and George Mason as people um, that we discussed last week. And it has other relevant info. And it's, it has the cost information there linked off of board docs. There's a table that lists all of the previous meetings where we've had any discussion about this and gives links to um, relevant documents. So that's up then and available. And um, if people, when the advertisement comes out in the news press, it will point to that website. People can go to that website to get to the community link to take the survey and also get to the link to go ahead and register to speak. So um, that was, that's come together and, and up online. And again, thanks to everybody who, uh, who worked on that one. So I don't know if there's any other questions. That's, that's kind of just to make everybody aware. We've got surveys ready to go. We've got a website up and running. We've got a registration form about, uh, about ready to open up and we will be having public hearings um, starting a week from Thursday. So. All right, um, not seeing any, any comments or anything. I'll just end this by saying, Thank you again, especially to Vice Chair Russell and Ms. Downs for your amazing work on the surveys and on the communications and to Mr. Brett and Ms. Goodell and Ms. Minson and uh, for your conversations with us, especially over the last few days as we've been, uh, been ironing everything out and, and thank you to everyone on staff who's helped us with this process. So um, we really do appreciate all of, the, all of the support we've had here. So, and thank you um, from me to all of you for all of the conversations and engagement in getting this going. All right, that brings us then to our uh, final business item for tonight, which is uh, 7.03, approval of second reading and adoption of policies. And Dr. Noonan, I would like to turn this over to you. 
Thank you. And I'm going to just roll it right over to Ms. Minson. I think we have just some policies tonight for second reading, and it didn't sound like there was a whole lot of um, uh, feedback on them, so they should go pretty quickly. So, well, Ms. Minson. If anyone wants to time me, we'll see how it goes. The first is policy DB, the annual budget policy. This would replace former policy 4.8, and there were no proposed changes following um, first reading or at right, first reading last month. Any questions about the policy on annual budget? Seeing a bunch of head shakes. I'll keep going unless anyone wants to speak up. Um, the next policy, DI, is financial accounting and reporting. This would replace the former policy 4.15. There were also no changes to this from first reading last month. Any question about policy DI? All right, the last policy for the evening is policy DJG, vendor relations. This would be a new policy, um, so it's not replacing a current policy. There were a couple questions last time about this policy that I wanted to report back on. Um, Mr. Reitinger, you had asked about um, whether the third paragraph beginning at line 17 needed to say specifically services to the school division or its students or employees. And in going back to review this, I would recommend that the board keep this language as is. Um, my reading of the policy is any sales to employees or students is governed by the first paragraph, which would require superintendent or principal permission to conduct any sales. So the sales such as yearbook class rings, the regular sales that take place every single year must be approved by the superintendent or the administrator. Whereas paragraph three, starting at, at line 17, says the limitation on vendors coming in to sell to employees or students in no way limits vendors of the division coming in and supplying goods and services. So an example of that might be refilling um, a soda machine. So those would be sales to the school division, not sales to the students or employees. There's also, um, Mr. Anderson, you, Dr. Anderson, you had asked a question about um, what of the language that was in here was statutory language. And I did confirm that the paragraph beginning at um, line 21, prohibition on solicitation or acceptance of gifts comes directly from Virginia code 2.24371. And the final paragraph disclosure of subsequent employment starting at line 28 comes directly from Virginia code 2.24370. Um, so there had been some questions about this policy I don't recommend that there are any changes from first reading, but happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Minson. Um, does anyone have any questions about uh, this policy? My question is answered, so uh, it's in code. All right, not seeing any questions, not seeing any sign of, of concern. I think at this point I would entertain a motion related to these um, to these policies. Mr. Webb. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the school board approve for second reading and adoption of policies DB, annual budget, DI, financial accounting and reporting, and DJG vendor relations as presented. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Is there a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Uh, Ms. Goodell. Yes, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimmick. Yes. Ms. Downs. Yes. Ms. Litton. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. Yes. Ms. Russell. Yes. And Mr. Webb. Yes. Thank you. And the motion passes. All right, thank you very much. Um, move on now to future agenda items and I'll just look around to see if there are any future agenda items anyone wishes to bring up. I see Dr. Noonan and Ms. Downs. Ms. Downs and then Dr. Noonan. Why, not, why don't you go with Dr. Noonan first? All right, then Dr. Noonan. Uh, we would like to put the school calendar uh, on the November work session. Um, and what we'd like to do is ask um, some, some very specific questions about, um, about the school calendar, not necessarily the process, but making sure that we understand what you're looking for in terms of one year, two year, uh, and the like. So if it's okay with you, we'd like to put that on for conversation at the next board session. 
Um, so you said next and you said November. Do you mean October oh, or? Sorry. Um, it may make sense to have a preliminary conversation at least uh, in October, given the, given the time that it takes to actually then go and do the, the work of doing the development. But I'm trust seeking clarification. I think, we think Kristen, looking at my partner here and William, I think if we could briefly know a one year or two year, some of those high level things in October, that yeah. might be helpful as we plan for the November work session. That'd be so good. Then so why we'll do don't it. we, yeah, why don't we go ahead and schedule uh, an item on, on the calendar for October and, and then we expand in November if we need to. Sounds good. I think I stole Miss Down's thunder though. You did. <laughs> I was going to ask a very insightful question about the school calendar and you beat me to it. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Um, does anyone else have any, uh, have any future agenda items to bring up at this point? Um, it's not a new one. It's just a reminder that for me to, to remind everyone that on the 27th in our work session in two weeks, we will be having a discussion about protocols about processes for having hybrid meetings um, with public participation, public attendance. And we'll be talking through that. I'll be coming back to everyone in a little bit more detail than we'll be doing some planning, but we'll, we'll have that conversation scheduled for October 27th, like we agreed last, last uh, meeting on the 6th. All right. Um, not seeing any others, I will say we're going to go ahead to our superintendent's report. And Dr. Great. Thank you so much. I'm gonna be looking over here at my notes. So forgive my, my eyes that are moving here. Um, just a couple of things that uh, I wanted to make sure, um, just to say thank you again to our staff at um, TJ at Mount Daniel and Jesse Thackeray uh, for welcoming a new group of students today. We're really excited to be off the ground there, but I also wanna thank the administrators, our bus drivers, custodians, uh, maintenance, tech team, food service and daycare, providers because it really has been an incredible team effort to just just to bring back you know the almost 80 students that we have imagine what it's going to be like when we start bringing back the thousands that we've got and look forward to that um, that day when it comes um, at Thomas Jefferson the library checkout program is super popular after four weeks 162 students with some repeaters um, have checked out through circulation 472 books uh, from TJ's curbside loan system um, and they can reserve um, books through the online um, TJ website and pick them up outside. And there are lots of opportunities and different days of the week to do that. So uh, for our TJ families, if you're looking for some books, please take us up on that. Um, Henderson and Mason staff are working with the PTSA and the boosters um, to present an extracurricular activity and small group um, socially distanced uh, opportunity sort of list um, and I want to thank them along with the SCA um, who has taken over the Halloween paint in so that small groups will be able to paint the windows in the city um, coming up which is a great opportunity for our kids to get together as well so as I mentioned earlier in the school reopening we are continuing to look for ways to promote um, opportunities for kids to get together that are safe and socially distanced even though we can't be back in school yet um, school counselors, um, for, for everyone, October is National Bullying Prevention Month. So on October 21st, um, the FCCPS counseling team, psychologists and social workers are going to be excited to participate in Unity Day. And uh, they are going to be encouraging the whole community to join in. So be on the lookout for that. Unity, Unity Day is a celebration of decisions to choose kindness, acceptance, and inclusion. Um, orange is the official Unity Day color. And one of the simplest ways that you can show solidarity around Unity Day and to stop bullying and show your, your unity or against bullying is to wear something orange that day. So again, um, that is October 21st, wear orange to show some solidarity and unity. Um, to our community, October 19th through 23rd is Community Partnership Week. And that's presented by our BIE, our SAO um, Business and Education Group. Uh, in recognition of the importance of partnerships between businesses, nonprofits, organizations, and our schools, the BIE partnership will be doing something every day uh, to recognize people who are involved in partnerships and encourage staff uh, and our community to work with their partners. FCCPS is super grateful to the hundreds of businesses, nonprofit organizations, 
and individuals who put their professional expertise to use to support our schools in so many different ways. And there's a full list of our partners on the BIE website. So if anybody wanted to go onto the BIE website and see what's there, that would be great. And then the FCCPS t-shirts, um, once again, were sponsored um, by um, the, the Falls Church Ed Foundation. And we wanna thank them um, for our annual hashtag team FCCPS, hashtag better together t-shirt. Um, my hope is that you should have received yours by now. Um, the third Thursday of every month is Team T-Shirt Day, and I invite all of you to wear your FCCPS T-shirt um, every third Thursday of the month, in um, uh, except for the 20. Uh, or let's see, um, invite you all to wear your T-shirt this Friday, the 16th, in solidarity, solidarity with our staff to start. But after that, it's the third Thursday. So if you want to start this Friday, that would be awesome. Um, and that. Uh, Jerry Anderson and, and board members is all I have to say tonight. I'm out of words after the school uh, report. Oh, John's holding up niche. Um, I did, I did want to um, congratulate our staff and our administration and the school board uh, for your outstanding work on niche.com. I don't typically pay attention to these kinds of things, but um, this time I couldn't look away. Uh, because the City of Falls Church Schools was named the best school district in Virginia by Niche, um, which is one of the major websites that people look at when they're moving to communities. Um, and so we are excited about that, that ranking anyway. So congratulations to all of you for your hard work as board members and to our teachers and our staff and our administrators for making us, um, making us shine. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over. Well, that's a that's a fantastic way to end it. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. That's um, well deserved recognition for all the hard work that the staff and the teachers and the uh, administration have been doing. So, thank you. Um, any questions or comments for Dr. Noonan on his report? All right, not seeing any. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Very much appreciate it. Um, we will go ahead and move on to board and student liaison comments. And I'm just going to go in alphabetical order so that it's uh, it's organized in some fashion. And I'll uh, ask uh, Dr. Dimmick um, if you have any comments or report. I have a couple of things. I attended the special ed advisory committee. Um, they mainly talked about the return to school. They also selected a new chair and they are going to take up our school board charge in their meeting next month. I went to the band boosters meeting. They are working on making their operations more digitally accessible. Um, they're also making equity and access a focal point in their work. They've noticed that um, there seems to be uh, an issue about ability to pay and a drop in band numbers at the lower levels. And they're looking at ways to help bring band back, research on PPE and instruments and the like. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Um, Ms. Downs. Thank you, uh, Chair Anderson. A uh, couple quick updates. Um, attended the Gifted and uh, Talented Committee meeting uh, last week where um, Ms. Jeannie Seabridge talked about um, the school board charge of really closing the gaps when we're looking at our Gifted and Talented program and um, mentoring some promising students. So we're going to um, continue that discussion. Uh, our ESOL uh, committee meeting is tomorrow night. Uh, the Mason um, PTSA, as Dr. Noonan um, referred to, is working with the other SAOs to find outdoor spaces to support uh, small uh, meetings for different groups outside of sports. Um, but the SAOs are sports-wise also working with athletics to help with COVID screening. Um, and just again, another plug that you know SAOs are, are ready to help whenever necessary. And then finally, Parks and Rec, um, we did not meet this month, but they are working on having a public hearing on what's going to be done with the fellow's property, which is the property across from TJ. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Um, and uh, Ms. Litton. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, just a couple things to mention. The elementary PTA met last week and their meeting featured our elementary school counselors who did a great job talking about kind of the role they're playing this fall um, for students in this new environment. 
um, and then they just answered a lot of parent questions. So they did a great job and we appreciate them coming out on a weeknight after working all day. Um, two other things to mention, the TJ pumpkin decorating contest, which I know a lot of people look forward to. They're gonna try and do that virtually. And the original artworks is that I think a lot of people order that for the holidays that will proceed there. They'll send out information about how, how it'll be done virtually. Um, and then finally, they're doing a fundraiser, I think a trivia night on November 13th. Um, the other thing I had to mention, Dr. Noonan luckily covered, it was the BIE Community Partnership Week. So I think he provided a few details on that. So thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Litton. Um, Mr. Rodinger. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Due to some schedule conflicts, I have not been as uh, uh, available to attend meetings as I should have been, so no reports from that. Um, I do have a um, some materials that I have <clears throat> from a family member who's a professional musician that I'll send to Dr. Demick about playing in orchestras and performance um, during the COVID era, so that might be helpful to her and the band visitors. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Um, Vice Chair Russell. Um, I have nothing to report right now, thanks. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Webb. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have, wasn't able to actually make it to the uh, Ed Foundation meeting last night because I was literally just got back in town um, five minutes before logging on for tonight's meeting, went down to Southern Virginia and internet is spotty at best when I'm at home visiting my family. But uh, the Ed Foundation uh, got the, an update on the return to school plan that we just got the update for tonight from Dr. Noonan. Uh, they also received their, some, did a overview of their audit and financials and mark your calendars, November 20th, they will be doing an online auction. So kind of taking the place of what would have been with the, uh, with the gala. Um, so that's my updates and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Webb. Um, due to a, a family issue that arose this morning, I wasn't able to attend this month's Chamber of Commerce board meeting. So I'm not able to report on that, although I will follow up. And if there's anything um, to bring to your attention, I will do so uh, at our next opportunity. And um, otherwise at this point, I don't have any um, additional things to report. And, uh, and we can go ahead and uh, and bring this part to a close. So thank you all very much um, for being out there and, and going to the meetings and talking with everyone and representing us. So um, the next thing on our agenda and it's the final business item on the agenda is we have a set of, me of minutes that, uh, that uh, uh, Ms. Goodell has prepared and posted for us. Um, we do need to, again, because we're doing this electronically, we actually have a, a roll call vote, but we can do one for all. So uh, I would seek a First, any comments on the minutes? Chair Anderson, can I? Yes, thank you, Ms. Goodell. I believe I there's a typo. It says December 2nd. It should say December 19th when, you're, when they're making the motion. Uh, yes, I did notice thank that. You. And thank you for reminding me, Sue. Thank you. Sorry about um, that. Thank you. First, are there any questions or revisions to any of the minutes? All right, then at that point, I would seek a motion and being careful that we're uh, talking about minutes from our December 19th, 2019 meeting. So, uh, Ms. Downs, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Chair Anderson, I move that the school board approve the minutes of December 19th, 2019, August 25th, 2020, September 1st, 2020, and September 8th, 2020 as presented. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick uh, and Ms. Goodell. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimmick. Yes. Ms. Downs. Yes. Ms. Litton. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. Yes. Ms. Russell. Yes. And Mr. Webb. Yes. Thank you, and the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, next thing is there is some material for board review on enrollment uh, in the schools and um, just looking to see if anyone has any
comments or questions on this information? I'm not seeing any at this point. Okay. Um, I'm looking for any final thoughts, any final motions that people are sort of giving me that they want to say something uh, and not seeing. Oh, Ms. Downs, go ahead. Sorry, I just very quick question. Um, Dr. Noonan, um, you had mentioned homeschool when I was looking at the the enrollment and all this. How can you remind me again? How are we reaching out to? Are we reaching out to the homeschool community, the students, families who pulled their kids out and are homeschooling? Are we getting back in touch with them? Could I'm sorry. Could you just? Sure. Um, yes, we are. Uh, tomorrow, Cecilia Guetta uh, in our office is starting to make calls, and she's the all of the homeschool applications that come in. Um, and based on the information that people shared with us, they said as soon as we open, they would want to come back. But um, we'll see whether they come back now or want to come back after the holidays. Okay, thank I just, when we were talking about enrollment, it just jogged me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Downs. All right. Not seeing anything else, I would say um, we are adjourned. And thank you all for uh, your, your work tonight. Thanks everybody. We just hit 400 on the, the intent form. So we're on our way.